I love to see the towns passing by and the ride is real beneath God's blue sky. Let me travel this land from the mountains to the sea, cause that's the life I bring. And when I'm gone and at my grave you stand, say God called home your rambling man. Welcome to Ramblin' Man Podcast, episode number 182. This one's with Stephanie Romer. We get her back on the episode, and we talk about the fact that she has pancreatic cancer and all she's gone through so far. It's a very uh, harrowing journey and that she is still going through, and I really appreciate her coming on and sharing her story. If you'd like to follow Stephanie online, you can find her on Instagram at Sono underscore Stephanie, S-O-K-N-O underscore Stephanie, standard spelling. There are times in this podcast where it sounds like I don't know what happened when we were recording, but there's some kind of interference, and very faintly, it sounds like we have music playing in the background. And maybe I only hear it because I have the computer cranked up all the way on the volume uh, to where I'm hearing every little popping squeak. Uh, but just in case, I apologize for that little bit of noise in the background if you crank up the episodes. But yeah, I really appreciate Stephanie for coming on. And spoiler alert, there may be another episode coming on down the line talking further about this journey. But yeah, I really appreciate her for being willing to open up and share her story. Sponsor this week is Feral John. Feral John is a graphic design, illustration, and social media consultation company based here in Knoxville, Tennessee. So they do work for clients big and small all over the country, all over the globe, in fact. But they also do photography, videography, video editing and audio editing, website design, SEO, writing, content development, Hell, they'll babysit your kids if it nets them money. So make sure you give them a follow on social media on either Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn at at Feral Giant. And be sure to give them an email today and hire them for your next project. Without much further ado, here's the episode. I will say on mic, if there's any of these questions you do not feel comfortable answering, please okay. skip okay. or throw something at I'll, some I'll make heavy the, shit over the, there. The, the yeah. chopping your head off okay. motion, whatever that's called, yeah. <laughs> Whereas in post, I'm going to add you throwing stuff at me and okay. me reacting to it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're here to talk about, oh my God. The C word. I almost made it. I was debating this whole time. <laughs> Wait, I got to do say, I will say one other thing that's kind of funny. Okay. Uh, considering we're talking about that error, there is a tiny thing of travel tissues right there. Okay. Those are probably as old as my high school years. I realized... Today, I have no tissues in this house. <laughs> I use paper towels or toilet paper because I'm. Oh, dumbass. so you, you think you're going to be like Oprah and make me cry? No, I, if, in case you did, <laughs> I'm prepping. I'm prepping. Okay. okay. So those were in it because we would buy those, like if we need it not to be gross, but blow our nose or anything. Dad would just buy a bulk thing because he, he was a truck driver. Yeah. So he needed something on the road, and I would just grab some and put leave them in the car or whatever. And I was like, Holy shit, these are the only tissues I have. These <laughs> tissues are 20-something years old. Well, it's I appreciate the, yeah. the, the thought. The only the... one has been used. <laughs> I was like, damn it, it's still open. I was like, I got it. I put it on my grocery list. I was like, I got to get <laughs> tissues. A back of, I don't know why, but it would be good to have. Mm -hmm. Okay, so back. So now back to the serious <laughs> shit. We are talking about the big C. We are talking about cancer. Yes. So first off, is there any cancer in your family? Not really. Um, my dad's youngest brother, my dad was one of 10 kids, and his youngest brother, the baby, um, Mike, he had a brain tumor. But um, 
and it like I guess you know with treatment it went away and then came back but that's been I mean decades okay now so that's it yeah that's it mm-hmm wow. yeah very lucky I guess <laughs> yeah well I mean I don't know I feel like anymore I don't want to say cancer is more normalized but it, it seems yo, like we totally yeah see he see and hear about it a lot more yeah I mean I would defy you to find anybody that doesn't hasn't been touched in some way yeah by cancer and not necessarily their family but you know yeah. friends and and it seems my experience now has been sort of a snowball effect of and maybe it's just me but I gather like once you have that diagnosis you end up people come crawling out of the woodwork yeah. and you hear about people that you know their family members have cancer or had cancer and you didn't know yeah. that they had it you know but people start talking about it once once you start talking about it it's so please feel free to throw something if this is in in polite or anything say i also think that a lot of the treatments and med- medicine mm-hmm. has gotten so much better oh definitely that maybe it's when you heard about cancer 40 years ago it was yeah death. yeah People That's are funny. also getting checked about on, on it a lot earlier now. Yes, than. yeah, um, huge strides, and you know, various because there's so many different kinds of cancer, um, and then you know, it's very like, you know, mainstream, like the whole pink ribbon thing and all these different ribbons. You know, that's, you know, the, the magnet, the the yellow magnet on the back of somebody's car. I mean, yeah, you see. Yeah. A lot more in here, a lot I'm more. I'm smiling and shaking my head because uh, my mom, who was a breast cancer survivor, mm-hmm. had a lot of hot. Imagine this, someone in my family having hot takes. She had a lot of home <laughs> hot takes about Susan G. Komen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She is, she's not a fan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not a fan. That, yeah. I mean, you know, it's like with any sort of, you know, charity organization or whatever, you should do your homework and make sure, you know, where yes. do the dollars go? Yeah. Because a lot of those, including some local places, you know, mm-hmm. the majority of the money goes to the executives and they're not doing as much or, you know, a ton of advertising yeah. and they're not doing as much as you think they are when it comes to actual research and, and helping the people helping, yeah. you know, the ones that actually have the need. So, okay. yeah. So I'm not arguing. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to argue with that statement. No. Yeah. Yeah. But we do, my dad and I still wear the little, she got us both pins yeah. that are the pink ribbon that we wear. And I, did not wear mine to the game yesterday and was freaking out the whole time because I had left it on my shirt from the night before. I was so tired Friday night that I forgot and threw it in the laundry Oh, basket, yeah. not oh, okay. in the laundry. Okay. <laughs> and dad even texted me days like, did you get that pen? I was like, yeah, I did. <laughs> I did it when I got home because I didn't want to, to accidentally wash it. Yeah. Well, we are talking about the purple ribbon, which is for okay. pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic Just so you know, cancer. yeah, it's a purple yes. ribbon, which I, I don't happen to have. I do have a purple bracelet that I got from the okay. Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. Yeah, pecan. I think that's yeah. I think it's pronounced pecan. <laughs> yeah. No, <I'm> <laughs> um, yeah. So the purple ribbon. Okay. For so that leads cancer. us to what was your initial or. I'm trying to think what some of these, I don't know which order to ask them, which is like, I'm going to ask two questions at once. What led to your initial diagnosis and what were you feeling that led you to that diagnosis or to that meeting or appointment? Well, so um, just a kind of backstory, I work remotely as an executive assistant and um, I have to go once every quarter down to Athens, Georgia, which is where our home offices and I was down in Athens for the quarterly meeting where all the executives get together <clears throat> sorry I feel like I have like vocal fry going on um, <laughs> um so I was down in Athens and you know I'm usually down there for like three or four days just going non-stop and then these meetings are literally like eight hours they we we sit in a conference room at a hotel for eight hours um and I take the notes for all these meetings and so that's what I was doing um and I, th- I got home that Friday and like Saturday. Oh, so I was going to preface all of this with um, be prepared for expletives and maybe some like graphic details about bodily functions. <laughs> okay. Because <Just, laughs> it's hard to talk about yeah. cancer and what happens without talking about. If it ever gets sort of too stuff. dark, I'm just going to put the Benny Hill music okay. underneath it to make it light. Um, yeah. So I got back from Athens and, you know, after three days, I was kind of tired whatever 
Um, but Saturday morning, um, when I got up and was getting dressed and everything, my urine was really dark. And I thought that I was just dehydrated. You know, I've been going nonstop for three days, you know, five plus hours on the road, eight hours of meetings. It's like, how much water did I really drink mm-hmm. while I was down there? It's like, yeah, I'm just dehydrated. So I was drinking a lot of water, you know, and of course, as you do that, things are obviously going to clear up and they did. But then the next day it was right back where it was. And we're talking like whiskey (laughs) colored. So it's like, that's not right. Um, So I went to a walk-in clinic and she ran all of the usual battery of tests and said, you know, it could just be a UTI, um, urinary tract infection. Mm -hmm. Um, And everything that she did came back negative, but they had to send off for that. So she went ahead and put me on antibiotics thinking that that's probably what it was. Did they um, give you a shoot? What's it called? The bag, the uh, bag, the fluids, the not at the time. Cause this okay. was just a, this was like a CVS. Well, th- okay. So, so, oh, so they weren't thinking clinic. you were yeah, cause like it was the dehydrated weekend. and what, what, yeah. what's that called? Why am I blanking on just IV fluids? IV. Yeah. yeah. I, see, I told you words, man, words. I had to, I have a cheat sheet. Wait, cause I just <laughs> said CTE and then I just hit <laughs> yeah. myself on the head. I think you're finding why I don't remember words. Words, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah no, so she just, I mean, I had a fever, but it was fairly low. So it wasn't a, like, you need to go to the emergency room yeah. kind of thing. And um, she put me on antibiotics, and I was having some pain, some back pain, some abdominal pain. Again, stuff that could totally be a UTI or something, yeah. you know, or a bladder infection or something like that. Um but then I started just feeling really, really bad. Um, and just the pain kept getting worse and I was having nausea. Um, and I thought that I was having a reaction to the antibiotics. So I quit taking the antibiotics and everything just kept getting worse. Well, that was that week that we had that really crappy snowstorm and like everything shut down. So I couldn't, I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't, there was nothing I could do. We couldn't get out of our driveway and I kept getting worse. I'm just thinking of the hills around you mm-hmm. trying to even get to Chapman yeah, for a little inside baseball baseball for Knoxville people. <laughs> like <laughs> just the hills around there to try and get to Chapman. Everybody would, all those kids yeah. were probably sledding on them because they're oh, so yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah, There was, yeah, there was no getting out of our driveway. Yeah. would have been impossible. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Going up and around. Yeah. Can it kind of put a pin and go backwards a yeah. second? Again, if you don't feel like. Do you, I remember this is more of a inside baseball. You and I know one another. You had <laughs> slowed down to to the point of quit drinking because you were like the 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 next day is always too hard. Which I, it seems like ever since you said that, I keep hearing more and more people were like, I, "Well, was that before? That was before, wasn't it?" Yeah. Well, okay. So I'll I'll back up even further. So last October. I hired a um, nutritionist and personal trainer yeah. and had been working with her um, until like middle of December, I think. And so I'd already, I'd lost like 25 pounds. Yeah. Um, I was doing, um, you know, sort of calorie counting, kind of slash low carb, just because mm-hmm. I've, you know, it's one of those things that's been ingrained in me since I was in, I don't know, middle school, you know, like puberty, all of a sudden keto's the thing. Um so, yeah, I had cut way cut back, wasn't really drinking at all. And, yeah, you know, you get to be a certain age, I guess. And it just you realize, yeah, OK, I'm not in my 20s anymore. Like, I can't I can't hang. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, my question was, do you think maybe some of that were early signs of this? Uh, well, I mean, some of the symptoms are things like, um, you know, weight loss. But yeah. I wouldn't have known. Yeah. You know, because I was intentionally trying and successfully losing weight. And I yeah. thought it was because I had changed my diet and I wasn't drinking and I was working out for like the first time ever in my adult life. Um, so, I, I mean, I may have that may have contributed to the weight loss. Okay. And I just wasn't aware because, okay. again, I, I quit. I quit working with the trainer in like December because I felt like I knew enough that I could yeah. continue doing stuff on my own. Like, I think I had a good handle on things. And then this was the end of January. Um, was when we had the snowstorm and yeah. whatnot. Um, so back to that, it snowed. We had enough that like the city, everything shut down for like four or five days. And by Wednesday of that week, remember I got back Friday night. Saturday mm-hmm. was when I went to the walk-in clinic. Sunday, Monday, the world shut down. By Wednesday, I said to Tim, I was like, whatever we have to do, I need to go to the emergency room tomorrow because I'm feeling so bad and something is like bad mm-hmm. wrong. I don't know what. 
but I just have this feeling they're going to tell me something really bad. And so, yeah, Thursday he took me to the ER and they did, you know, all the blood work and stuff. And initially they thought that I had hepatitis A, which I guess is the kind of thing that you get when you travel out of the country. You pick it up from food that hasn't been. This is just my crappy recollection of kind of what she told me was that that's how you get hep A is from huh. food and generally in like foreign countries and stuff. So she, they were grilling me about, you know, have you traveled? Well, yes, but to Athens, Georgia. So yeah. she's like, okay, well, that's probably not the case then. <laughs> so like, what did you eat when you were in Athens? Did you have any kind of like, you know, foreign food? Like, no, we had like pasta and salad and yeah. pizza and stuff. So, so that it, wasn't it. It was a conference. It was crappy hotel. <laughs> yeah, I, well, it was oh, actually, yeah, but, yeah. I, I, that's my job. I do the ordering. So I got, oh, yeah. I got good that's food. Right. It was, that's it was right. good stuff. But. Well, I just came back from a conference <laughs> in Atlanta. I was like, man, that food was terrible. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> like, we need you to. Order. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, I work for the executives. So yeah. you know, I'm trying to make them happy and I have to eat it too. So I'm going to yeah. get, this, you know, within budget, whatever. You're, good. you're but, texting your boss, Julie. Like, do you like, uh, Black and salmon? No, I, I don't care. That's what we're having tomorrow because that's what I want. <laughs> He's totally happy as long as he doesn't have to deal with it and he just shows up and everything's good to go. Hell that's, yeah. I'm, you know, I've Hell got a yeah. budget. You go do it. So, yeah, anyway. Um, so, yeah, they ran a battery of tests and they ended up taking me back for a CT scan. And the CT scan is what showed a mass on my pancreas. And so they, they came in and they were like, well, Good news is we figured out what's wrong. The bad news is it's cancer. And I was like, okay. I mean, like, and I didn't Tim even. was with you when that happened. No, I was by myself, okay. um, which I don't remember why. I guess because I knew that, you know, you go to the ER at, at UT and it's like never ending. You're there for yeah. hours on end. And it was like, there's no point in you just sitting here being miserable with me around all these other sick people. Yeah. So, you know, just because I think he had something coming up maybe. It was like he needed to travel and I didn't want him to get sick yeah. being around everybody else so yeah especially january in a hospital yeah good sweet mm-hmm. lord yeah yeah my record for sitting in a the um er ut is uh 14 hours and so here's something that most people don't know and i was blissfully unaware of they have a separate waiting area for people with cancer it's a very small little room with like two like they almost look like benches you would see like a bus station or something basically and there's like a tv and that's it. And that's the little holding area just because you're, you know, immunocompromised. Yeah. They don't want you around the rest of the sick population. So you kind of get to jump the line, but not really. Cause I, like I said, I still sat there for uh, 14 hours the last time I had to go. And then, so this is the fun part of all of this is that it's the things that you find out as you go through the process or the things you find out that are like, Oh, what is, what's, Oh, did you ever see the movie? Um, Oh, see, words, it's, it's gone, it's gone. Um, the quote from the movie is, well, that's useless information for me now. Do you do know you, the actors? Do you know that? Do you know the, um, who, oh, see, now I can't remember his name either. The guy from Chattanooga that passed away recently. Uh, Leslie Jordan. Uh, uh, oh. Oh, that weird, like, soap opera. Yes. I have never seen that. <gasps> uh, I know. It's and one I'm of those, like, oh, I, I struggle with... Uh, it's not called like past lives. Sorted, Sorted lives. lives. Oh, okay. You win. Yes. Oh, yeah. it's a great movie. Yeah. You got to watch that. Yeah. I think it's when they're, because isn't it kind of like bad on purpose? Yeah. It's like, it's, it's what is, uh, the tagline is, uh, it's a, oh God, my brain the cylinders just are not firing today. I think, I see, I'm going to look it up because I think they also made a TV it's series a, it's out, a of, out of it. Dark comedy about white trash, I think is the, the tagline for that movie. And oh. it, it is. That's a great movie. Okay. Uh, it was based on a play. Mm-hmm. Te- television series. Oh, the movie came out here for anybody listening at home. The film came out in 2000. There were two, there was a TV series mm-hmm. in 2008 and then a, a very sorted, sort. Yeah. Sorted wedding. wedding. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm saying that wrong word. That word wrong. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Also, I went to the UT Alabama game yesterday, and uh, I can mm. am hearing a constant ringing in my ear because mm. it was consistently over 120 decibels throughout the game, and my brain is not braining <laughs> today. I drank a pot and two cups because I had two left over yesterday 
of coffee, and this is me on that. So. Well, and I, I forewarned Jody that I, I wrote, I brought a cheat sheet because there is such a thing as chemo yeah. brain, and it, it takes a while for your brain to okay. uh, process I'm gonna leave and remember. This- I'm, so sorted lives, yes. I'm going to leave but, this up so I can remember to look for it. <laughs> the later. quote, the quote is, "Well, that something like, well, that's useful information for me now." And that I've had that quote in my head so many times throughout this whole ordeal because I find things out after the fact, like this, you know, little waiting room for cancer patients, which yeah. is great and all. The very last time I went to the ER, my um, one of the one of the baby doctors at UT not a baby doctor, the yeah. a resident, they, they call them baby doctors. Yeah. Um, he said to me, he's like, well, next time you have to come to the ER, call us, call the oncology office, even if it's after hours and let them know that you're going to the ER and then we can help you like get expedited through the process. And I just looked at him like, really? Like now you tell me that yeah. I spent 14 hours sitting down there last night. Now you tell me you, how many ER visits I've had since January. And now you tell me this, like, thanks. Great to know. Well, this to know. Goes so. to the, did I ever tell you the story about when mom got diagnosed? Mm-mm. So mom got diagnosed with breast cancer. They were in the office with the doctor. And this is, and my dad was in there too. My dad, six foot four, big giant mm-hmm. truck driver. This is before he lost all the weight. So he's probably six four, 437 <laughs> pounds. And the, this is very, how would you say, this is very non 2024. The okay. statement I'm about to say. <laughs> So they're going to leave and the doctor shakes my dad's hand, hand and says, we're going to take care of your girl for you. And my dad just pulled the guy in and said, you're fucking right. You are or something <laughs> like that. And I was like, that doctor maybe should not have said that Yeah. in that moment. To yeah. my very large dad who was like, if you don't, I will be back. Yeah. <laughs> I, will, I will end you. Yeah. <laughs> so another thing I found out, well into the process. I mean, we're talking eight rounds of chemo. So six months, eight rounds of chemo. And um, I have I had to go every two weeks for chemo. And before they do the chemo, they do labs to check everything, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so, which means they have to draw blood. So again, sorry for anybody who's squeamish, but um, I have really crappy veins, which I apparently inherited from my dad. And so they're like super tiny. They're hard to find. They have a tendency to roll um, oh. or they'll hit it and then they're like, Oh, that one dried up. We got to try again. You know, they always ask, you know, do you have a preference, which arm? And I'm like, I just put both arms out. I'm like, dude, you tell me, like, yeah. you got to find it. Yeah. I don't care. You're just the professional. try to do it once. If you could, yeah. that'd be swell. You know, uh, never the case. I've, I mean, I've had, I've had them do the back of my hand and like weird places because my veins are so shitty. And I find out, I forget who mentioned it. Somebody finally said, they're like, well, you know, you can get like a heating pad, or one of those little, you know, hot packet things like you put in your yeah. pocket kind of thing, like yeah. hunters use and stuff. Yeah. You can put that on your vein and that'll help make the veins like swell up and come to the surface. I'm like, now you tell me this? Yeah. Like, I, I have special cream I use to make bruises go away so that I don't look like I've been beaten up because they would try and, it, you know, the veins would blow. And so, like, oh, we got to do another spot. We got to do another spot. And I mean, I would come home looking like I'd been shooting up or something. Yeah. I'm sorry. Like, I shouldn't. Talk no. about things like that but it's true i mean I, I i would wear long sleeves because it was embarrassing how many bruises i had which is just from going in and trying to get blood draws for stuff so but yeah so there's a little tidbit number two heating like, pad heating pads if you're not good with needles <laughs> this, this is great pad, this is a go. teaching podcast <laughs> yeah yeah well that so it that is i guess sort of the thing that has come out of this for me is talking to other people and telling them things that may be useful yeah. like if there's anything i can do from all of this that comes from all of this it's yeah. like here's here's what i found out and this could be helpful to somebody else and that includes the diagnosis because again on paper it just sounded like i had some sort of infection you know yeah. um and then it turns out that those are all symptoms of pancreatic cancer and i'm kind of a fluke because the average age for somebody with pancreatic cancer is 70 like over 65 holy hell yeah it okay. is typical and most people are even older than that so and i'm 45 I was 45 at the time of diagnosis so i'm i'm a freak <laughs> I'm, I'm a rarity <clears throat> no you're so, well, i'm trying to think of a word no you're special i'm special you're special well we knew that so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 
you get the diagnosis. Uh, was that with a an oncologist? Did you did they yeah. already have like? here's what the next year is going to look like for you or, or is that a later meeting? Yeah, no, that, that all came later. The diagnosis came from the ER doc. Okay. Um, and they said that I had the, the pain was probably a combination of the, so where the pancreas sits, um, it's in a really weird spot. That's like, obviously it's in your, your abdomen. Yeah. Um, it's above the, the navel, um, but it's kind of tucked in behind a lot of other things. Yeah. Um, it's close to a lot of very important veins that supply um, blood to your heart. Um, your, the gallbladder is kind of also in that same area. So it's kind of hard to see, which is why, you know, the CT scans are sometimes kind of iffy. Um, and so part of the blood work, they look for a special pl- protein in your blood. And in this case, it's called CA199. And that that is the tumor marker. Okay. So they were able to confirm that what they were able to see um, on the CT scan was for sure pancreatic cancer because of that number. Um, And I also had things like elevated um, liver enzymes because my liver wasn't functioning properly because things were blocked. I had my bile ducts were were blocked, which is a big deal. (laughs) Obviously, you don't want bile backing up in your system. Um, That's what causes things like jaundice, um, which I did not have when I went to the emergency room, but by the time they got me into a room, I started getting jaundice. So yellowing of the skin and eyes. Um, and it's just because you have all of these nasty things backing up into your body that are supposed to be flushed out, but my bile ducts were blocked. So that was not happening. And so they said, we have to do surgery, um, as soon as possible, probably tomorrow. Cause it was late in the day, but by this point, um, and so, yeah, so the next morning, I guess it was, they took me in pretty early and they put in um, what's called a biliary drain on the lower right side of my abdomen. So they put an actual hole in you and they put a drain in so that, that all of that stuff has somewhere to go. Um, and they tried to put a stent like you would get in your heart. Mm-hmm. Um, they tried to put a stent in the biliary drain to open it up, but they weren't able to do that or not in the bili- in the bile duct. They tried to put a stent in the bile duct um, and it didn't didn't work. So they had to put in a biliary drain, which means all that stuff drains externally. Mm -hmm. Um, But this particular drain, they were able to do it so that it drained both internal and external. So they kind of bypassed the biliary or the bile ducts Mm -hmm. and rerouted it like internal. But just in case that didn't work, there was also like an external knob, let's call it, so that it could drain out. Would you so, do that? Did they tell you to do that X amount of times per day, the drain? Or oh, did it they just, just like Or would it automatically do it? It automatically did it. Yeah. If it did wasn't it do it into not to oh, hell, we're, we're crossing the gross line. <laughs> did it do it into a bag? Yes. Okay. Yes. I had to wear a bag, um, very similar to like a, a colostomy, colostomy bag, bag is probably yeah. what most people yeah. would think of. Um, yeah. I, if it wasn't draining out into the bag then that meant that it was and I wasn't getting worse I wasn't having fevers and things and that meant that the internal part was was working they had okay. like I said they bypassed the bile ducts and had the internal part if if it wasn't coming out where I could see it then that meant it was doing what it's supposed to inside and I kind of didn't really have to worry about it but these these drains you know they're man-made they're plastic kind of a rubbery plastic is what they have to be, you know, so that your body doesn't like absorb them basically. Mm -hmm. Um, And like anything else man-made, they don't, your body doesn't want it to be there. They have a tendency to fail. Yeah. Um, I think I had mine replaced three times. Um, The first time they went in, they're like, we're going to put in a bigger one. So hopefully that will help. Yeah. Um, But yeah, if it wasn't draining internally, then I had to empty the bag every time it would get to a certain amount and I had to keep, I had to keep a diary of how much and when and all that. Yeah. It was mortifying, absolutely mortifying. So even if I had felt like doing anything or going anywhere, I was too just embarrassed and and mortified, even though like it was totally out of my control and this thing was actually saving my life. Um, But yeah, I mean, nobody wants to go run around with a bag attached to them and have to deal with that sort of thing. So that you keep, Everything you say makes me add another question to the top. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, was that the, I had to write, I wrote down like three. <laughs> Just, I was like, wait, I got one question and then okay. I've got three more. After. Was that the only thing they did when they did the surgery? 
initially yes was just the okay. um the biliary drain that was the first thing to get to get the bile flowing like it needed to be and save my life basically maybe you can answer this i this may be an incredibly naive question mm-hmm. why can they not just go in and remove the cancerous tumor then um so they can okay there are two ways of of thinking about this and it's changed over the years. Um, the standard of care used to be that that was what you did first was go in and take out the tumor immediately. Yeah. Um, but they have found over the years, um, doing chemo first and then removing the tumor produces a better result, generally speaking. Okay. And, you know, of course that's based on, you know, the individual patient and their, you know, how healthy they are. Um, you know, obviously I was healthy enough that I could withstand chemo. Some people just are not, you know, and you have to do so many rounds of chemo. In my case, it was six months or eight rounds of chemo. And then they give you a break for your body and your immune system to recover. And then they do the surgery. Yeah. Some people just can't do that. And, you know, it's like we got to do surgery now and then we'll do some chemo afterwards if there's a possibility. There's always a possibility that the cancer has, has spread Um, Or is in your blood and just hasn't like set up shop in a new location yet. Yeah. So um, that's also a concern. And yeah, the standard used to be surgery first. We do surgery and then we do chemo. But they found that the response is better if they do chemo first, generally speaking. My grandfather, he had had a heart attack, I think sometime in his 60s. But then he got diagnosed with prostate cancer in his like mid 70s. Mm -hmm. And when they, he started doing chemo, I think he was, I don't know where he was at in the chemo, but he lost an an egregious amount of weight. Yeah. And he had another heart attack. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, it was probably he was too old. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it just was too much. Well, and then there's different kinds of chemo. Yeah. Um, This was also (laughs) in like 19... 98 mm-hmm. like yeah. this was a long time ago so yeah the leaps and bounds since yes. then yeah. yeah is great well all of my oncologists felt that sorry <clears throat> nope. felt that um doing chemo first was the way to go so yeah okay did they tell you how big the mass was oh and that's one thing i didn't write down it was a couple of centimeters. I want to say okay. it was like four centimeters. It, uh, Holy shit. That's... Yeah. Like n- not quite golf ball size or so, yeah. I think. I mean, it was fairly so in comparison to your pancreas. Like it was. Yeah. And it was on the head of the pancreas. So the, the pancreas is kind of, I don't even know how to describe it. It's shaped, I guess, like a T-bone would be a good oh, okay. way. So you've got like a wide end, which is the head. And then it narrows to the tail. You know, it's funny. I was going to say, oh, you mean like a liver? <laughs> Isn't a liver, a liver is kind of built like. Is it? I think also? it's kind of like that. Yeah. Okay. But I was like, I was going to compare it to another. <clears throat> Another organ. Yeah. 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 Well, mine was on the head of the pancreas, um, which is not, again, the pancreas is situated in a place that's difficult to get to. Um, And then, okay, um, this is another like forewarning. It gets kind of, kind of interesting slash gross here. My um, um, surgical oncologist said that the pancreas is, it's like butter. It's so like when he's removing the tumor you have to go in and you know obviously put sutures in and stitch up the place that you removed and he said like imagine trying to put stitches in butter that's basically what it's like so it's very difficult to work on um he was he was lucky i was unlucky that i was having severe pancreatitis at the time which made my pancreas like hard as a rock oh so yeah and pancreatitis is something i would not wish on my worst enemy it is it is pain worse than you can possibly imagine i've been told it's worse than kidney stones i've been told it's comparable to giving birth like the level of pain is so bad what and there's pancreatitis uh, it's basically where your pancreas is inflamed um, okay. and it gets really angry um, in my case like i said it got hard 
um, which made it very easy for him to sew, but it made it extremely painful yeah, for me. For um, and the pancreas also, um, there's a lot of nerves through there um, that push on the spine or and yeah. the tumor like made the nerves push on the spine. So I was having back pain. I couldn't stand up straight, um, which came later. That that was not the case when I first went to the emergency room. And you know when I got my initial diagnosis, it was this was right around the time I had to have surgery. Okay. Um, but I'll back up a little bit because I forget when in the process, what month it was, maybe February or March, they gave me what's called a celiac plexus nerve block. I'm super impressed that I remembered all of those words. <laughs> um, so they, they go in with a needle and they give you a shot, which my understanding is it's just like alcohol, basically. Mm. Um, they, they go straight through your abdomen to this nerve and inject it, and it basically puts that nerve to sleep. And so it's kind of like a um, long-term long lasting anesthesia that like kills that nerve. So it helps with pain from like pancreas or if you had like gallbladder issues or whatever, I guess it's also used for that. So you don't need that nerve to be uh, no batting a thousand to survive. Mm -mm. No, Mm -mm. no, it just, it, it, that basically is a pain receptor. Oh, so yeah. So it, great. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So yeah. So they gave me the shot, which helped with the pain, um, which is why I didn't, I wasn't feeling tremendous pain when they had, when they did the surgery, when, yeah. you know, he's like, well, it's no wonder that, you know, you were having issues because your pancreas was very angry. <laughs> yeah. So you still have your gallbladder. No, okay. that is part of, um, so the surgery that they do for what well, you had it before I did. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I, yeah. So uh, fun fact, I, to this day have never had a tooth cavity. I've never broken a bone. Uh, uh, I want to flip this computer up because I don't think I've had one tooth that has not had a cavity. <laughs> so. so I, this was all completely new and foreign to me. Like, I mean, I, you know, I've never had any kind of surgery, nothing, no I was, anesthesia. I was going to say on the flip side, I don't, I don't think I've ever been put under before. Like I had tubes put in my ears when mm-hmm. I was nine, 10 months old after that. Never been put under. Yeah. yeah. Never. This was this was my first wow. Yeah, experience with anesthesia and, and all of that. And it wasn't wasn't none of it was as scary as I thought it was gonna be. Um yeah. but the procedure is called the Whipple procedure. Um and that's where they remove the tumor from the head of the pancreas. It's something different if the tumor's located in a different spot huh. if it's on the tail. But so um they remove they remove the tumor and part of the pancreas, um, the gallbladder um, I honestly can't remember if they've messed with the spleen or not. I think it depends in certain cases. Um, the bile ducts were rerouted, um, because they removed part of my small intestine. Um, and so they, yeah, so they reroute the bile ducts to mm-hmm. a different part. So I think they, ha- I had lost about 12 inches of my small intestine in this process. So yeah, so you're going to lose weight one way or the other. Yeah. <laughs> one way or the other. You're going to, Yeah. Um, which I didn't lose a whole lot. Um, well, you had already lost. Well, I had when I was trying to back last year, and, and then, then this all <laughs> happened. At the Christmas tree, the Christmas tree cakes. Debbie's <laughs> like, I had, and then Christmas happened. And then Christmas <laughs> happened. Yeah, I did have, I did, I did indulge in those a lot. Yes, Jody is so kind and got me my favorite bad treat ever: the little Debbie Christmas st- tree cakes. Which side note, rambling man, I, there are. <laughs> Two different sizes. Is this what you're? No, no, no. Okay. Two different additional treats. I sent you the donuts. Apparently, there's another thing too, <gasps> and I can't remember. How did I not send it to you? Well, I was offended. I, I think my I, husband I think got I me saw it on TikTok, and I may have sent it to you on TikTok, but I think. You and Aaron Donovan have both told me I don't check TikTok. Yeah, I don't, I don't do yeah. So, TikTok. so you may have a flood of stuff for me on TikTok, <laughs> but there's something else too. But it's also that weird thing we've gotten. We've entered this place in time to where stuff is not available everywhere, which I do not understand. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like as silly as this sounds. Okay, we really the be, insert Benny Hill theme here. <laughs> when Deadpool Wolverine came out, there's a popcorn bucket. Oh. Do you know about this? 
There was one for uh, Dune that oh, looked yeah. like the sandworm that looked like Dune. a sex toy. Yeah. So Ryan Reynolds saw that and said, we're going to lean into that. And he made a popcorn bucket that looked like Wolverine going. Oh, like no. Like wide mouth. That. And it, so Sean is like, Pointer was like, I'm not kidding. The day that movie comes out, I will be at the theater <laughs> at 10.01 to buy that popcorn bucket. Mm-hmm. And then we found out like two or three days before, oh, it's only at AMC theaters. Yeah. It's not anywhere else. Yeah. And so ever since that, I've been noticing. Which do we like, even have an AMC anymore? Because no. there was one over there by your, your folks' place. And there was one out there. And then there was one out at, I think, the Carmack at Windsong had turned into an AMC. But I don't think it's at uh, Best Buy. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's there anymore or it's open Mm-mm-mm. anymore. So I think that was an AMC. I think closest AMC is Nashville. And Sean was like, I'm not driving to Nashville. I was like, no, buy one on eBay if you really want it. Yeah. He was, and at that point, he was like, I think I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, it was great when I was going. But ever since then, I started noticing things. And I follow an Instagram account called Candy Hunting. Uh-huh. And she'll be like, there'll be some crazy ice cream flavor. I was like, I want to get that. And she was like, oh, that's not available. Yeah. It's only available in the upper, mid, midi, middle what would you call it? I wouldn't say Midwest, but I guess it's Midwest, yeah. like Minnesota, Wisconsin, yeah. all those. I was like, well, didn't they, didn't the, the ice cream, Little Debbie did the, the Christmas yeah. tree cake ice cream, but you could only get it at Walmart, even yes. though like everybody carries Little yes. Debbie, but you could only get it there. So, and like they have the, um, um, Stranger Things ice cream there, but I think okay. it's like only at Walmart and like the Snoop Dogg ice cream, like only at Walmart. So, yeah. I don't get yeah. all those. Well, I, Tim bought me a box of these for Christmas, but and I opened them and I was immediately pissed off because they were tiny and I was like, "What the hell?" Like, I remember you telling me this? Yeah, this is like, you know, those things from your childhood. I remember going to Sandy Springs Park um, in Maryville as an adult, and everything seemed so little. You know, yeah. it's like, has it been that long since I've had ice, ice the, the Christmas tree cakes that they've just gotten that small? No, no, no. The individual ones that you get, like in a gas station, are almost twice as big. It's same thing with oatmeal cream pies. Yeah. Like if you buy the French. standard size, it's smaller than it used to be. So I always get the like family ones because they're a little bit bigger than what they used to be. But there's, but it's like that's different. I'm telling you, that's different. Oh my god. How did we start talking about Christmas tree cakes? <laughs> uh, okay, so we're gonna go back to. One of the other questions I wrote down, which is for the drain. <laughs> okay, again, I'm going to ask like four questions at once. Did the first time you do it, <laughs> did you retch? Because I assume it is disgusting. And did you build up like a tolerance to where you could handle it? Um, I'm not one of those people uh, who has a hard time with blood or bodily functions. Oh. Um, so I'm going to log that. So, yeah. cause I am, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't know anybody that loves needles. So, you know, when I do have to get blood drawn or whatever, I turn, I look away and you know, they're, they're like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I just don't, I don't, I have a thing about needles. It's not the actual, like I can see blood. Tim, no, he will pass out. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, with Tim. Yeah. I, we, <laughs> when I was at pet safe, we were getting, uh, they would actually bring in twice a year doctors and nurses mm-hmm. to give us full physicals yeah. in the office and they drew blood and it's this big room and it's me and this older woman. She's t- drawing my blood and I'm sitting on this comically small chair, mm-hmm. folding chair. And she said, I was like, Hey, before you start this, I don't like needles. And she was like, okay. I was like, no, I don't like needles. Like if I see this, yeah, I'm either going to vomit or I'm going to pass out. And she yeah. was like, I can't pick you up off the floor. I was like, <laughs> I was like I'm going to look this way. She's yeah. like, that sounds good to me. Yeah. And she did it. And she, I don't know what she did to numb me, but I think she put like four times as much because she was like, I, I can't pick this dude off the floor. So she, yeah. <laughs> she like really numbed me where I didn't even feel the pinch or anything. Yeah. No, no, I'll, I'll tell him. I'll be like, I'm not going to look. And I, please do not, you know, do a countdown. I, that's not helpful to me, yeah. you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, the it's, the the biliary drain is just um it, it's just a fluid it's another type of fluid from your body um so it it's just kind of a, a brown liquid basically 
Um, it's yeah. I mean, is it pleasant? No, I, obviously, like I said, it's the kind of thing I was too mortified to be out in public with this thing attached to me, but, right. um, it's, it's different in a lot of ways from a col- col- colostomy bag. If I can get the word out. Um, but similar in that, again, it's something that is external that you have to deal with and, you know, the, the bag can only hold so much. And so you gotta, you gotta get rid of it and you gotta log how much, so, I mean, yeah, I have to actually put it into a container that has markings on it. Yeah. Which is, I mean, there's, which I never understood because there's markings on the bag, Yeah, but I guess, and you know, it's a bag and it's liquid. And so it, it's not very accurate compared to putting it in like a measuring cup. I think this answers my follow-up question, which is, is it like a Ziploc bag that the minute you, you know, disconnect it, you can Ziploc it and throw it the hell away? No, no, no. Did you you have to reuse the same? mm, Yeah. You get, you get so many um, bags and they have, um, they have valves that you, you know, you got to attach and you screw and unscrew. There's a valve you actually have to like. Yeah. It's 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 really bizarre. I mean, when you think about the miracles of modern medicine, it's it's crazy. The yeah. fact that I had this like plastic rubber tube in me, yeah, and your body doesn't automatically reject that is is yeah kind of bonkers, you know. Well, um, but and you're also essentially living with a hole in your side yeah. because it, it there's internal and, and external, and so there's a hole, and so you, I mean, I had to be very careful. It had to be you know. Um, kept covered i had to you know like i couldn't i had to disconnect the bag to take a shower i had to try to not get that area wet which is like impossible to do um but yeah there's like a a valve you just turn the valve so that nothing comes out and then you disconnect the bag and you just dump it into the toilet and flush it once you've marked however many ounces it is and stuff so yeah tim be like was tim like i'll be in the bar (laughs) yeah no you know i i mean to his credit um when he needed to step up when I was feeling really bad and having difficulty um, because it's also in this, this case it's located kind of like right around the bottom of your rib cage Mm -hmm. on the right side. So lower kind of right side. Um, And being female, there are things that kind of get in the way of being able to see everything. And so sometimes it's difficult to reconnect. And when you just, you know, when you just feel like shit and you know, your hands are shaky and And you're worn out and and you're, you can't, yeah. yeah, I can't stand up straight. I got, things in the way and um so yeah when it mattered he he jumped in and never was never even squeamish about it and so you know god love him hopefully he he didn't have to do it much but i'm gonna have him on as a (laughs) bonus at the end he's gonna be like it grossed me the hell out (laughs) i I put earplugs in my nose (laughs) (laughs) well i will we also were extremely fortunate that um my mom um who had been doing pseudo home health stuff she basically was she was my mom ironically had been um working home health for a lady who had a brain tumor and um she basically she would go 6 6 p.m to 6 a.m and just kind of hang out and she had there there had to be somebody there around the clock and mom would just help her like get to the bathroom help her eat help her take her meds stuff like that like she wasn't like you know, dispensing meds or anything yeah. of that nature, but she's done a lot of that. And so she's got experience helping people like me. Um, and this lady's family had finally gotten to a point where, um, she needed to be in an assisted living slash hospice type situation. Um, so mom was in between jobs and I was like, Hey, you want to, you want to come work for me instead? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I might need some help. And, um, you know, it having her around enabled Tim to keep working full time yeah. and not have to, because on days when I had to have chemo, that's a, that's a whole day. Mm-hmm. I would be there, you know, eight o'clock in the morning. Um, they would do labs. Then I would meet with my doctor and then I would go to the, the floor where they have all the chemo chairs and you sit there, they connect you. I have a port, which I still have. I won't show it to you cause it, it might make you squeamish, but yeah. Um, I will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's, yeah, so well, I haven't puked on the podcast yet. That's a new one. <laughs> hey, it I took was, to episode one eighty one for Jody to puke on. The I'm podcast. looking to set some records. I was hoping to beat Erin, but it turns out she's not the one to beat. No, it's pointless. Adam, right? For uh, the, the most episodes. Did I say Adam? It's either Adam or Pointner. Yeah, one of the two. This is. I think this is my third. So I'm not setting any records yet, but I'm getting there. I'm, I'm out, Adam, out to get him. Adam. Okay, because I'm going <laughs> to follow down this path. Adam was on episode he was on two episodes very early the trip to brazil mm-hmm. 
And that was another reason why I think I thought of them. is because they had done it. They were the second episode, I think. Okay. And then Friends in the Social Media Age. I just heard him and, then, and Amy talking about their trip to... And then the England. refill coffee cart. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Five years, six years. And then... Uh, them going to the UK. Yeah. And then, so that's four. Uh-huh. And then Pointner. So I'm gaining ground. I got three after today. But I think Pointner is. <laughs> yeah. Pointner is. Uh, Hell's Bells. Probably a lot. He has been on a lot because he has also been part of groups. So it was yeah. like, he was on very early on where it was like friendships in bars and cigar shops mm-hmm. and it was essentially yep. me recapping a trip i took from knoxville to cleveland to mm-hmm. knoxville to detroit to chicago and we sat on the house on the front porch of the house on quincy smoking cigars and yep. drinking yep. doing that episode and then one on art with david Harmon and joachim schmidt one on photography with sarai and jasmine I one got a ways on, to go is what you're telling one me. One on Marvel films. <laughs> well, no, I'm trying to tell you what to. you need to aim for. <laughs> one on Marvel films where I just got picked on the entire time. <laughs> so that's five. Okay. Oops. And I think he'll have one coming up. I haven't asked him yet, <sighs> but I think February will be a Sean Pointner photography anniversary. Hmm. Okay. Anytime I, because I know he won't listen. <laughs> He never remembers how many years it's been. Yeah. And I'm like, I want to do, since I did one with Adam about refill, I'd like yeah. to do one with Sean yeah. about navigating through COVID, yeah. you know, and all that work on your own. So that'll be seven. So okay. you got to get got, eight. Oh, okay. okay. Well, let's hope I you, don't have any other. Here's the thing. thing. <laughs> I got to get Tim on back on to talk about Don the Beachcomber okay. to promote the book yeah. and the movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So when he comes on, you have to be a guest. Of course. Of course. Yes. We can't do this without <laughs> you. I mean, come on. So that puts you at four. Okay. All right. I'm getting there. Getting yeah. There. Well, and hopefully I'll be able to come back and talk about the success of the clinical trial that I'm yes. doing. Spoiler. Yeah. Spoiler. Spoiler alert. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have here, because it's mm-hmm. somebody you know, uh, you with this, you have passed Leslie. Okay. Because she was on the <laughs> <laughs> I love Leslie. That, yeah. I know that sounded really evil. That was no. <laughs> I think Donovan's only been on twice. No. Wait, no. Oh, I forgot about the mountain biking episode. Yeah. She was on the first one for the mountain biking. She was on episode 100, and then she was on with the AMBC, AMBC. folks. Mm-hmm. So that's three. So you're tied with Aaron Donovan. Uh-huh. Gotcha, Although Aaron. episode 200 She's, is yeah. right around the corner, and she'll be back for that. So you got eight episodes. Okay. You got it. That's, that's goals. The, that's the goal. <laughs> So, yeah, you got to mm-hmm. come back on and talk about trial, Tim, with... All the, the Dawn the Beachcomber stuff. All the Dawn the Beachcomber stuff, and we'll figure out other stuff. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, you had Wait. you had more questions, or no? Did I, because you I'm had... I'm trying to think, have you been on... Shit, I forgot about an episode, but... Because I did the Grateful episode in 2020, and I think, didn't you and Tim... Didn't I did, we... yeah, you did, yeah, or it was like a... Christmassy yes. thing, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I did that. Okay, without him, yeah. okay. And then we had, mm, seems like fairly early on, we yeah, did the, the tiki. tiki bar, yeah, yeah, the one that you all still claim that I fell asleep in the middle of the podcast. I was dozing. I was tired. Oh, thanks. <laughs> no, it wasn't you all. It was because remember I walked in with a big old thing of coffee. Being yeah, like, yeah. I am so oh, incredibly yeah. tired, and it was so. Calming and relaxing. It is. There. It is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's dark and cozy. And mm-hmm. well, Friday I went and saw Jillian Welch, Welch, and mm-hmm. David Rollins, and it was like I had had a long day of an offsite twenty twenty five planning meeting mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. where I had to drive to Deep West Knoxville. So I was driving to Deep West Knoxville at seven thirty in the morning. Yeah. Had that, and then it ended at like four. We went and had, and I had three very heavy beers. And so when I came home, I'm sitting here trying to eat and falling asleep. And then I go to that show, and I'm having a hard time keeping my eyes open because it is so calm. Yeah. And warm and dark. I was like, 
oh, I could just sleep right here. <laughs> and the dude next to me kept talking to me. I was like, that's what it was. I was just tired. I swear. I was just tired. It wasn't y'all. I was just tired. I think I listened back. I was like, I didn't snore. And y'all didn't say, I think he's asleep. <laughs> Should we let him sleep? I didn't hear any of that. So. All right. Enough of the goofiness. <clears throat> um, okay. So, but we're going to go back a little bit. Okay. So you find out on a, you said a Thursday? Yeah, it was the Thursday that week that we had the okay. hellacious snowstorm. So how January was January 22nd, I think, is the day that I was diagnosed. This is, this is the, I maybe should look at the time. I'm not sure if you want me to cut any of this out. Tell me if you want me to cut any of this out. Okay. You start, at what point do you all, like, do you, do you all sit down and say, okay, we've got to tell. I'm sure there was the first, like, your mom, your, your family and all that. But then yeah. start going to the outer circles. <laughs> and you was, all did something different. Facebook group. Yeah, Facebook group. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, it's funny. Yeah, because I, I, it came in handy. I, was, I flipped back through that Facebook group that I made last night to kind of give myself a timeline of events. Yeah. And, and it's funny some of the things that I wrote, I clearly was, I'm looking back at it now, like I was heavily medicated. They had me on some, some heavy drugs because of the pain and everything. And it's like, I remember that post. I don't remember everything that I said and wrote in that hey post. Guys, but did you see how purple the sky was <laughs> earlier? Um, now my mom, I mean, my mom was in the loop that I was ill and was going to go to the hospital. She knew I'd been feeling bad and had been to the walk-in clinic mm-hmm. and stuff. And so when the doctor came in and said, Hey, yeah, you, it's confirmed. You have cancer. Um, I called my mom and was like, here's the deal, you know? Yeah. And I, the funny thing is like, I never cried. I, um, for other reasons, um, female related issues always kind of anticipated that at some point, um, they're going to say you have cancer. Yeah. Um, I, I have very dense tissue, um, in certain areas. Mm-hmm. And so that makes you, um, a lot more susceptible to getting breast cancer. Um, and so I know that, um, and it's just a, you know, it's just a fact of life for a certain percentage of women. And so I guess knowing that somehow kind of set me up so that when I did get the cancer diagnosis, it didn't come as a complete shock. I guess okay. in the back of my mind, I kind of always thought someday they're going to come back and they're going to say, well, this biopsy was positive. Okay. So, so I didn't cry and I called my mom and I was like, well, it's cancer. And the surprising thing is that it's pancreatic cancer, which is like really rare for somebody my age, you know, and she, I guess I, I get it from her. Cause she was just kind of like, okay, what do we have to do? Yeah. You know? And that, my whole motto this whole time has been just do it and get through it. Like everything I've had to deal with the, the chemo, the biliary drain, you know, the surgery for the biliary drain. It's like, just, just do it and get through it. Like yeah. if I, if I dwell on it, I'm going to freak myself out yeah. or I am going to get upset. And that, that's not going to do anybody any good. You know, I don't need my mom or Tim seeing me in tears, um, which Lord knows there was plenty of it later on. Which Can, but, can I add an asterisk in here? Which is totally fine. If you need to cry yeah, no. through all this, yeah, it's no. okay. I yeah. just, it just was, that was, that was my whole MO was I just, I just got to do it and get through it. And early on there was kind of a light at the end of the tunnel. They gave us this time frame, the, the oncology team mm-hmm. and they were like, okay, so this is our plan of attack. We're going to, we're going to do six months, eight rounds of chemo um, every two weeks. Um, and then you'll take some time off four to six weeks for your body to recuperate. And then you'll have surgery, the Whipple procedure. Um, and that's probably going to take, you know, two months or so for you to recover from that. And then you'll have four more rounds. So 12 total rounds of chemo. And, you know, with the every two week rate, plus the time off in between things, we kind of figured like September, October, we'd be done. And I'm using air quotes here Mm -hmm. because, you know, with cancer, you never know for sure. But there were a lot of setbacks. Um, Like I said, I had to have the drain replaced three times. And that caused a delay in getting chemo because I had to recuperate from that. Um, There were just various times where I got um, I had my white blood cell count dropped way too low for them to give me chemo one time. So I had to have this thing called new Lasta that looks like those things that people with diabetes wear, the, the monitors yeah. that sticks yeah, yeah. to your arm. It's, it's basically like that. 
Um, so you go in for chemo, um, and they after they give you the chemo, they put this little thing on your arm, and it it injects you 24 hours after they put it on. Basically, it just the needle pops out. It's got a timer built in, and it injects you with this stuff to help boost your white blood cell count. Huh. Which okay, in most cases is a good thing, but in my case, it it um, basically my my like bone marrow went into overdrive trying to produce white blood cells. So I, I went the other way and I got sick from my body was just like go 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 go, and it caused a fever and huh. like other things because my body was solely focused on producing white blood cells. Okay. So, so I had various things throughout the process and it's just, you know, the doctors don't know, there's no way to predict how anybody's going to react to the chemo or how they're going to react to like the new Lasta and stuff like that. So anyway. Okay. Um, so you told your mom, told mom and then, um, you know, Tim and I talked about it and I, he was trying to keep people filled in via text message and phone call. And it was just so many people that we needed to tell. And it was exhausting trying to answer everybody's questions and answer the same questions over and over again. And I was like, fuck it, let's just do like a Facebook group. Yeah. And then anybody that wants to know, because some people may not want to know about all this, you know, they may not just, you know, Yeah. so we did. Yeah. So I did a Facebook, created a Facebook group, a private Facebook group with just cancer updates and, but then posted about it publicly. And was like, Hey, if you want to follow along with my cancer journey, here you go. Um, but yeah, so my, the initial post was, um, Hey, I have cancer. Hope you were sitting down. <laughs> Tim, I still, oh my God. Surely I've shared with you when Tim called me. No. So he Tell- called me on Sunday. Okay. Here's how I remember that. Okay. Cause my, I had had my alarm set for like, let's say 10 o'clock. Cause I hate the mornings and <laughs> I just happened to wake up before my alarm went off, looked at my phone. I was like, ah, I'm going to go ahead. It was like 935 or something. I was like, I'm going to go ahead and get up. And right as I was looking at it, the phone rang. Oh, yeah. Okay. And so I'm barely awake. I had to pull out my mouth guard. And I was like, oh, oh, hello. <laughs> and he was like, hey, Jody. And I was like, hey, what's, what's, <laughs> what's going happening? On? And he kept dragging it out. <laughs> And finally, he was like, she has cancer. I was like, okay. Is she okay? Like, <laughs> Luckily, if I'd been more awake, I was like, hey, man, spit out, man. Is she alive? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I need to know she's alive. Uh-huh. And he was like, yes. I was like, okay. Okay. Good God. Yeah. Scared shit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, thankfully, I was groggy. And I didn't like, yeah. And it. That's funny. And I'm not bagging or it was just funny that yeah. where it was just like, dude, I'm going to start throwing stuff. You don't tell <laughs> me if she's okay already. or not. Because it almost sounded like she was in a car accident. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think, I mean, you I, he, you may have said that or he may have told me, but again, chemo brain is, is yeah. a real thing. And, and I think I waited a while to tell, I was like, what the, literally sitting there on my phone, like, I don't know what to text you. So I yeah. like put it away and didn't text yeah. you until like that afternoon or night. Because I was like, fucking sucks you're gonna make it through <laughs> kick ass like yeah i don't yeah. know what to say you that know? the the facebook group has been great um I, and i will say i'm i've been surprised at some of the people that have reached out to me and have sent me cards or little gifts and text messages and then some people that didn't that i would have expected it's kind of kind of a trip but yeah you know people deal with things differently and you know, but some of the people that have reached out to me, I really just kind of taken me aback and, you know, but well, I've had a tremendous support system. In defense of some people, I will say, I've kind of left y'all alone because I was like, I don't want to be a burden. I don't yeah. want to be in the way. You're going to have bad, because going through all this with mom, it was like, yeah, you're going to have some very bad days and mm-hmm. I don't want to be like, no, but we said we were going to do something. On, so yeah. Just like, yeah. Whenever you feel ready, we'll just go do something. Yeah. It's like, I, yeah. Do your thing. Like, yeah. Take whatever you need. Yeah. And whenever you're ready, let's, yeah, go eat pretzels. And <laughs> pretzels ice <cream>. and ice cream. <laughs> oh my God. Shout out to Sugar Queen. Uh-huh. I still have <laughs> some of the ice cream in my freezer right now. The banana bread mm-hmm. one. I saw that. Because mm-hmm. I can't eat sweets after 7 p.m. Yeah. And so most nights I don't eat dinner until 6 or 6 30. I'm like, can't do it. Can't do it. Really yeah. want to do it. Would demolish <laughs> this entire pint that barely fits in my hand. 
I was like, I would eat this entire thing in one. In one sitting. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I was happy to do that because it was during <laughs> the day. And I was like, yeah. I will be fine. Yeah. It took a long time before I finally was feeling up to, to, to doing that. It's, and it's still hard. I mean, even today you texted me this morning. I was like, yeah, I'm game. I mean, I woke up feeling great this morning. Yeah. And then we went and had breakfast and I don't, it, this is not because of the restaurant. It's just, I just never know from day to day, yeah. hour to hour sometimes. Um, so that the Whipple procedure is a massive surgery. And um, my particular surgery, he said it was probably only going to take like four or five hours, but I think it was close to nine hours. Um, so, I mean, you're under anesthesia for a very long time and they take a lot of stuff out. And apparently anytime they mess with your intestines and stuff mm. in the abdomen, recovery takes months and months and months, to, which is hard. Like it's, it's it's uh, screws with your head when you look in the mirror and well and in my case I lost about a little over half of my hair but I elected early on I was like I'm not I have enough hair for four people so mm-hmm. I'm not gonna shave my head Rub I'm just gonna in. I'm gonna yeah, see fine. what happens <laughs> <laughs> so and I um and this is that's another tidbit that I hope you know maybe somebody will hear this and be like you know if the day comes God forbid that somebody else gets a diagnosis of cancer like they will know that you don't have to shave your head i mean i think movies and <clears throat> tv and stuff people think that that's like an automatic you're going to lose all your hair yeah um and then even now well and when i was doing chemo i was shocked at how many people came in and were sitting in the chairs next to me and had full head of hair yeah. men and women and now um at the clinical trial place these women coming in with full head of hair um maybe thin like mine you know there's significantly less but and that one thing, that sense of normalcy, it, it, I can't put into words like what a difference that, I, what I think a difference that made. Just looking in the mirror and you look normal. Yeah. But it's also at the same time it's hard because then people look at you and they, they're, I mean, like everybody, even my doctors, they were like, you look great. You, you're doing so good. You look so good. It's like, maybe it's because I still have my hair and yeah. because I've lost weight, you know, yeah. and whatever. But um yeah, I just went off on a tangent now, and I, I don't remember where well, we were going with I that. Did I ever we're... tell you about mom and the hair? <laughs> uh-uh. So she started losing it, but she would lose it, like, in her sleep or while she yeah. was eating to where it would get, like, in her mouth. Like, yeah. So it fell out. So she called God, God love mom. She called me and was like, hey, sweetie, uh, I need you to come shave my head. Oh. And she was like, and you have so much experience with that. <laughs> There's just nobody better. I was like, I was like, okay, I cut him, mom. <laughs> Thanks. Like one of the kids at work asked me, he was like, when did you start going bald? I was like, first off, fuck you. And second <laughs> off, when I was like 19. <laughs> so uh, there are photos at my college graduation where it's already. Yeah. Like thinning is nuts. But. Well, I I mean, I don't want anybody to feel bad if that's something that they have to do or they feel they should do. The mom thing. So I go over and I take my clippers because I used to just trim with clippers. And I was like, do you want to leave some hair or do you want Mm -hmm. it all gone? Mm -hmm. I was like, I'll go either put a guard on or I'll put. And she's like, no, no, no. All the way. I was like, cool. So I'm shaving and I get about halfway done. And she grabs him here and looks. She's like, oh, I didn't mean that short. (laughs) And then oh, and I was like, well, it's too late now, Mom. <laughs> so we keep shaving, and I get to the end, and she looks. She's like, I still look damn cute. And I was like, yes, Aww. Mom, you do. Aww. And then I was like, all right, I'm going to go. And she's like, wait, why are you going? I was like, because Dad's not home yet, and I need to be gone. You need to be gone. Before he gets here. And sees you. He was like, what the shit? Like, Because he didn't know. And I was like, no, I need to be. I need baby back in my house with doors. Yeah. And shit. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet though. I mean, that's yeah. cool that you did that for her. Well, and the other thing is I would go to when I was working at the paper and luckily this is a weird thing. To sound luckily when my boss Vivian, I think her sister or her mom had had cancer mm-hmm. and she was like, anytime you need to leave to take care of stuff, mm-hmm. you, you don't clock out. Well, Fuck the newspaper. So I don't feel bad at saying that. Yeah. So I would go <laughs> to her. Now, her chemo treatments were only like, it would be a Friday. I would pick her up at like, let's say, 10 a.m. Mm-hmm. And I, we would be gone for like, say, three hours. Mm-hmm. And then I would take her home and it would be done. She didn't have any appointments or anything. Yeah. But she, 
uh, I would take her. I would sit back. I would, first time I went, I was like, do you want me to sit out here? Do you? And she was like, no, I want you to go back here with me. I was like, mm-hmm. are they okay with me being mm-hmm. back there? And she's like, yeah. yep, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So it was all these older ladies. Oh, look at this. This is adorable. Her mm-hmm. boy. Her boy. Yeah. <laughs> her little baby. She's like, this is my little baby. <laughs> and they're like, that's a big baby. <laughs> and uh, would sit back there with her. And then we were done. When I would get her in the car, she would go, all right now, honey, I, I want a milkshake. And you can have one too. I'll buy you one no. too. So we would go through Arby's, mm-hmm. McDonald's, whatever. Fast food, milkshakes. Milkshakes yeah. are still okay. It's just ice cream. Fast food milkshake. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. a text conversation for <laughs> yeah, me. I, yeah. Uh, uh, and we would get milkshakes. And then I would get her in the house. And she's like, all right, honey, put this in the freezer. I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> I'm tired. I was like, and we would get her into bed. And then I would take off and go back to work. Like, And that happened a lot. And then my sister, I love this one. My sister took her the last chemo treatment. Mm-hmm. And then when they left, they went to Applebee's by Easttown Mall. Mm-hmm. And the waitress came over and said, she was like, okay, now here's here's how it is, sweetie. I just had my last chemo treatment. This is my daughter. She is under 21. But here's what you're going to do. You're going to serve us both margaritas. Because <laughs> that's what, or daiquiri or whatever yeah. it was. She was like, we're going to have that. And that's not going to be a problem. Is it, sweetie? And <laughs> they're like, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. Nope. She can have alcohol. <laughs> like the daughter who's 19 or something can have alcohol. Because well, this lady will hurt us. <laughs> no, no, no. That one of the things that you, you know, you're talking about like not drinking and stuff. So I, obviously, you know, each, each cancer, each patient, you know, gets different stuff. The, the chemo that I was on is called Fulfirinox. And it's four different chemotherapy drugs. One of which is called um, Oxaplatin, I think is what it's called. And in most people, it causes severe uh, reaction to anything cold, sensitivity to anything cold. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So cold to the touch hurts. Like it, it, even though um, I also developed like um, chemo induced neuropathy in my fingers and toes, I still, if I touch anything cold, like just opening the, the fridge, the, just the yeah. metal on my hands hurt. But it also made it so that if I were to ingest anything cold, it felt like I was swallowing glass. It was awful so i couldn't i couldn't have i had to have room temperature water and even at that it sometimes was a little too cold and i'd have to like you know nuke the water or just like tea like i to this day i'm like i I don't want any more hot tea because that was all i could drink any anything even remotely cold it was like swallowing glass so i couldn't have ice cream i couldn't have ice water no milkshakes but then like towards the end of the two-week period like right about the time you're getting ready to go get chemo again it would start to wear off and so i'd have like a day or two that i could have ice cream or ice water and it was those oh glorious it's like <laughs> you know, like you go and you, you like tap the fridge and you're like oh it doesn't hurt all right let's go get milkshakes like let's, yeah jamocha shake arby's yeah let's go Right now. <laughs> we gotta go. Get... Oh my god. <clears throat> uh, oh my god. See, I don't know if we've already. I think we've already covered that. Okay. The next question I have was Would you mind walking us through the treatments you've undergone? But you've kind of. Yeah, up chemo. To a point, like, mm. we'll, we'll get into the trials in a second. Okay. But, uh, what do you think has been the most challenging aspect of undergoing treatment? Um, well, that's, I don't really know how to answer that. We were talking about it last night and I said to Tim that in a way, I'm kind of glad that COVID happened before all this because it kind of prepared me for, you know, had I not lived through, you know, two plus years of COVID and, you know, being isolated and what, whatnot, this probably would have seemed a lot worse, you know, Okay. but having lived through that. Now I know what it's like to have to wear masks everywhere because I'm worried that people are going to make me sick. I'm going to come in yeah. contact with somebody. And I may have weeks where I just feel like shit and I'm just not up to going anywhere and I have to cancel plans and just be ill, you know. Yeah. And that again, it's a lot like COVID, you know, it's just that it's it prepared me. I think it prepared us in some way. Because um, the spoiler alert is. How long before you got diagnosed with this did Tim have his issue? 
Oh, he had, you're talking about the, the, yeah, he had a trip to the hospital and yeah. had a stent put in and all that. And Yeah, heart issues. Yeah, I don't remember when that was. That was, yeah. It was only like a year, year and a half before, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it was like it early. Wasn't that. Yeah. It was in the COVID time. And he had another instant, instance that I think most people don't know about. He went down for the grand opening of the new Don the Beachcomber in Tampa. I think you told me. That. And but, yeah. Uh, but the people he, listening are not me. So well, go ahead. Sorry. Well, he, <laughs> he, you know, had a couple beverages. It was another situation where, you know, you're just going and going and going. And um, I can't, I think he did a presentation and, um, and then, you know, there's this big celebration and everybody was drinking and he had to fly out at the ass crack of dawn the next day. And he doesn't do good. Like he gets motion sickness anyway, like in the oh. car. He can't look at his cell phone while I'm driving because yeah. he'll get sick. So long story short, mom went to pick him up from the airport. And by the time she got to him, he was like pretty ill and thought he was having a heart attack. So she had to take him. She tried to take him to UT and then got confused with all the new exits and stuff. Oh, and God. Ended up taking him to Fort Sanders. And, and I'm like... Um, a I was not allowed to drive that was another that was one of the more difficult things about this whole diagnosis and the medication they had me on I didn't drive for eight nine months and you don't realize like when you are completely dependent on other people to take you everywhere yeah. you can't just go and you can't just go pick something up you know yeah. and um, the advent of grocery delivery was a lifesaver I mean, hello, Walmart plus membership, because I couldn't just go to the store and get stuff. And if I did, it's a whole thing where you got to mask up and wipe the cart down and mm -hmm. try and stay away from people. And, you know, um, so not driving. Well, you try to stay away from people anyway. Though. Well, you generally, know. yeah. You know, people. <laughs> Sorry, that was too easy. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. so yeah, so she took him to she took him to Fort Sanders and. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't get to him. I didn't have, I mean, yeah. other than like hopping in an Uber, I couldn't, I couldn't be there. And it ended up that, um, he, he was, uh, just dehydrated and, you know, they gave yeah. him some fluids and they did a stress test and everything and was fine. But yeah, I mean, that's, you, uh, sir, we ran some tests and your body at this point is 65% rum. <laughs> Does that sound about right? And he was like, it's kind of low. I mean, he, well, <laughs> but no, I mean, Tim yeah. taking strays on the this podcast. Funny thing is, you know, when I, you know, obviously I changed my diet, it affects his. And so yeah. the, you know, I was eating really well and eating super healthy and not drinking much, which meant that he was also by default yeah. eating well and not drinking much. And so that, I think that contributed to it too, that he really hadn't had anything to drink in a while. And so even though they were just little, like, you know, samples of things yeah. or whatever and he just he hadn't eaten much hadn't had any water hadn't had anything to drink in a long time and probably so, lack of sleep too uh, lack mm -hmm. of sleep yeah. and then yeah. yeah and then being on a plane and it's just stuffy and yeah. yeah and so and he just he he's not a very good sick person he's gonna get mad at me for saying this but he's he he tends to when he's sick you know he's sick yeah. you know so um my poor mom yeah picked him up and they went straight from the airport to the hospital and he ended up he was fine thank god but it was really difficult for me to just yeah. be sitting at home not knowing what was going on and i had no way to get there and it wasn't smart for me to go because then i would be exposing myself to all these other people so yeah. that's that's maybe the hardest part is that even though you want to go do stuff you can't yeah you know um but again covid kind of yeah. helped with the mindset of all of that i guess if there's any bright side to covid it's yeah <laughs> Wait, I, I was just gonna let it breathe so you could finish that i'm adding another note for the end uh, okay uh oh and then i realized you know once i did start driving again i also wasn't listening to music like that's i, I can't listen to music while i'm working it i i just i can't Mm -hmm. ADD over here I can't have multiple things going on that's too much of a distraction for me so the only time I really listen to music is when I'm in the car so I went like eight months without really listening to music and then when I finally did get in the car and turn the music on I was jamming yeah <laughs> jamming and singing along yeah and it's I like wow the the time that you did not drive Adam and I have talked about this before I said I think uh COVID was a factory reset mm -hmm. on people ability to drive like i hadn't said this tim but i was like i feel like everybody should have to take the tests again because we have talked about oh. i can't tell you how many times driving 
out Woodland, you know, past Fulton and going towards 275, mm -hmm. seeing people come from the side roads and not even pause at mm -hmm. stop signs. And I was like, everybody now yeah. is just driving however the hell they want. <laughs> And so I, I'm saying <laughs> yeah. for you, like being off the road for eight or nine months and then all of a sudden driving again, it's like, what the hell happened to everybody? Like, and it seems like it gets worse every time, every day. And I'm an aggressive driver anyway. Yeah. It makes me insane when people don't follow basic rules and, you know, yeah. like, or, yeah, yeah. So I, the, you know, I guess in that regard, I didn't really miss much. <laughs> so the first time so. you drove, did you were like... Hell's bells! I'm going to end up in Virginia just because I, I need to get the hell off on the drive on, get out there. No, I mean it. Just it, I think it really dawned on me. It was like, oh, music! My God, I haven't listened to music in yeah. I don't know how long. But it's funny. Um, I I met a guy um, who had the exact same diagnosis as me. Um, his name's Howard. I met him through my boss. Um, I, I don't know how it all came about. My boss is um, he was on a board for something and he was talking to another lady who's on the board and somehow my name came up and she in my diagnosis and she's like oh she should talk to my husband because he had that same he was diagnosed 22 years ago um yeah wait they, and he had to have been younger for his age he yeah he was in his 40s in his mid 40s when he was diagnosed because like, he can't be 90 <laughs> something now right <laughs> yeah <clears throat> Um, so she's like, yeah, she needs to talk to my husband because he had the exact same, it was in the head of the pancreas. He had the Whipple procedure back then. It was a, a new thing, yeah. um, to, to do that because you know, what we were talking about before, like with chemo, how much things have changed. Um, and I was thinking about what was that? The Truman Capote show that came on recently, the swans or whatever. Oh, yeah. One of the characters is getting chemo, mm, spoiler alert, is getting chemo in that show and they're doing it like intravenously through her mm -hmm. arm. Um, so ports like weren't a thing and she, she's like smoking and getting chemo at the same yeah. time. I'm like, my God, how much things have changed. But, um, how I, so I ended, ended up meeting this guy, Howard, um, who's a huge advocate. Um, and he goes to these things in Washington and he's connected with some of the top pancreatic cancer doctors in the world that worked on like the human genome project and everything. I mean, he's, he's, okay. he's the man. I've got um, a couple books in there on the Human Genome <clears throat> Project. I wonder if he's in those books. He, quite possibly. Um, That's wild. Okay. But he, one of the things he said to me was that there, there will be milestones and events that happen. And one of those for him was when he drove for the first time. And so I kind of already had that thought in my head because he was talking about the realization when it hit him that, you know, this is the first time I've driven and eight months and same I got in the car and it's like I had to adjust the seat for me you know because <laughs> we have two cars but Tim's car is not like a daily driver situation so yeah. he usually we usually take my car everywhere and you know yeah it was the first time I'd been in the in the driver's seat in like eight months and had to reset everything and then I pulled out of the driveway and was like holy shit this is the first time I've driven yeah. in a really long time these it's people crazy. on Chapman Highway are nuts yeah Chapman Highway is always nuts yeah yeah uh, <clears throat> so, okay, so you said you did not cry. Right. Did you use, were there any, oh my God, this is going to sound really fancy coming out of my mouth. <laughs> did you use any coping <clears throat> mechanisms or meditation or journaling or support groups to help get with some of the mental health aspects um, of it all? Yeah, so acupuncture, I was already doing acupuncture. Um, give a shout out to my friend Amber, um, who just gave birth to twins seven and a half pound twins each holy um, moly yeah holy moly okay um i was already doing acupuncture um and that is something that actually the university of tennessee uh cancer center has uh, uh integrative health department in the cancer building um and so they offer acupuncture massage therapy uh facials um, they have different like sound therapy classes and stuff and they're all like either free or reduced rate for people who have cancer and then their family members also can go take part in these services. So I'm still doing acupuncture there. Um, I'm going to, I had a facial there. I'm going to go do a massage there. Um, I'm not really into meditation and stuff like that. Um, and, um, but yeah, like support group wise, that's something, you know, like I said, people start coming out of the woodwork when you get a diagnosis like yeah. this, you find out, Oh, well, you know, like you, you know, my mom had cancer and, you know, which I, what reason do you have to tell anybody, you know, it's not generally the kind of thing you just go around 
talking about. But Except then, for I love telling the funny stories about the shaving of the head and <laughs> the, the dad handshake and the mm-hmm. <laughs> and the milkshakes and my sister getting my sister drunk. Yeah. <laughs> Those are worth telling. I, well, yeah. There is a PS that I will not tell on this podcast again. I think I have once or twice before, but it does not reflect well on someone in town. And I have uh, kind of been let known that I maybe need to not talk about that. But oh, okay. I will tell you, I will write it down as a note for after. Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So I met Howard through my boss. Yeah. Um, and it, I think he was the first person that I talked to that had the same diagnosis, that had been through the surgery, had been through the same exact. Um, well, his chemo was different because the fulfirinox didn't exist at the time. Um, but still, you know, similar symptoms and stuff. Yeah. Um, and he was just, he's the nicest guy. He's been super helpful. He gave me a referral to a big time doctor out in Arizona, um, to talk to, to, you know, get a second opinion or whatever, and to talk to about clinical trials. Cause he's, he's well connected in the clinical trial world too. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the pancreatic cancer action network, I joined that, um, and they have a peer support group. And so they connected me with a lady named Jenna in long Island, um, who had again, same diagnosis. She's only a couple years older than me. Um, yeah. So, you know, and I got to talk to her and hear her experience and we check in with each other, you know, through text messages. She's not on Facebook or anything. Um, which Good is weird. Her. Somebody Good my age her. that, yeah, I know, but her. that's rare that you meet somebody young. I was gonna say, there is part young-ish. of me that wonders cause it's so rare mm-hmm. in your age group. Do they like hold on to the people that are in the age group to be like, we're not going to pair them with a 70 year old or we're not going to pair you with right. a 70 year old. Right. We've got a handful of people who are in yeah. their forties or fifties. We're going to hold out. the <laughs> Like, I don't want to say yeah. hold out, but be like, <laughs> We, if you heard from a 70 year old, it may not have as it much of be. an impact as well. Their experience could be entirely yeah. different just because or even Howard. Yeah. That he was your age when, even though he's 60 something now, right. that he was your age when it went through before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so talking to the two of them has been great. And then, um, I'm in a, a different Facebook group called lady, no kids. <laughs> and somebody, um, posted in that group that she had just gotten a, a breast cancer, diagnosis with a, a very aggressive um incurable form of breast cancer um and she lives in finland but she's originally from illinois and um she posted just saying you know i can't imagine getting a diagnosis like this and having kids and like yeah how do you how do you tell your kids and how do you you know deal with treatments and feeling sick and trying to take care of small humans at the same time like i'm so grateful that i never had kids and so i comment and it was like you know same boat I just got a diagnosis and so we started chatting um through Facebook Messenger and um and now like for a while we were she was going through chemo was having a really hard time and I had just started chemo and so I think it was her idea to send each other a photo every day of something that made us happy and it might have just been you know the dog you know or a, a flower a or <laughs> yeah um and so and we kind of we kind of became pen pals um Finland has really weird rules around packages and stuff. And it's really expensive to ship stuff there. So we kind of just do postcards and and stuff. But, um, you know, we check in with each other regularly. And even though, you know, her cancer is a lot different and her treatment is a lot different, but we have a lot of the same experiences. And that's been tremendously helpful to be able to talk to somebody. And, and you know, she's her sister moved to Finland um, to be close to her. Um, But she said, she's like, you know, there's just some things like, I don't want to tell my husband and I don't want to tell my sister because I don't, I don't want to scare them. I don't want to make them feel bad, you yeah. know? And so it's been good for her to have me as that outlet and vice versa. Um, yeah. so I haven't joined any like support groups or anything. There's a lot available to me and to my family members, but I feel like I've been well supported with these people that have miraculously appeared, appeared yeah. in my life and have been like touchstones for me throughout this whole process. And help me keep my shit together. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking up. There's a movie that literally just came out called We Live in Time with Andrew Garfield and Florence Pugh. Mm-hmm. That I think part of the conceit is it. Uh, c- part of the conceit of it is that there are a younger couple that end up having a kid. And then she gets diagnosed with a very 
mm-hmm. may be aggressive mm-hmm. inoperable cancer. Mm-hmm. Like, and I've it's just like you don't really hear about that as mm-hmm. a movie or anything. Right. So it's like as we live in a time where more and more, what is it called? More and more people's stories get told. Yeah. It's good to have stuff. I know it's a fictional film. And it's two yeah. very pretty people and all, yada, yada, yada. But well, it's also. No, like you were talking what, about you know, like shaving your head. And I was thinking about that movie with, uh, oh, what's his name? Third, 50, 50? Third Rock from the Sun and 50, 50, 50. 50 Days of Summer. Like, what's the actor's name? Jonathan. Mm, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Yes. Okay. 500 Days of Summer. Okay. And the film's called 50 50. Okay. <laughs> with him and Seth Rogen and yeah. Anna Kendrick. Yeah. I just keep thinking about the scene where he's like shaving yeah. his head pretty early that's in the movie. That's the poster and... of the film. Yeah. Of yeah. the two of them with shock looks on yeah. their face. And see, that's, that's kind of the... And it's the real story of the either director or writer of that film. Mm-hmm. That I think is the person who wrote 500 Days of Summer. Okay. But yeah, yeah, it's the real... I love how I can spit out the most like... Yeah. Uh, random stuff and be like words yep no working no words, with gen but. z people is killing me because i will mention a band or mm-hmm. somebody do you know who casey musgraves is yeah do you know who father john misty is yes so he was opening for casey musgraves okay in these massive venues and i was like that seems weird seems odd because he is big right See, that's what you said. And then Casey Musgrave still seems like a Ryman Auditorium person mm-hmm. or a Tennessee theater person. And they were playing massive it's amphitheater. It's like a millennial effect kind of thing where people don't know who he is, but they know who she is. Uh, talking to a Gen Zer at work. And she was like, I don't I don't know who that Father John Misty is. Yeah. Like, How the hell? I was like, I guarantee you know at least three of his songs through TikTok because like three of his songs have been big on TikTok. <laughs> That's really sad. And well, hell, the <laughs> Fleetwood true. Mac thing still kills me during mm-hmm. the when the dude drinking the cranberry juice. But but she was like, but I know who Casey Musgraves is, and mm-hmm. she's big. And I was like, well, okay, just devil's advocate. Isn't she from Tennessee? Isn't she? Is she not from Knoxville? Am I wrong? No, Casey Musgraves is not. Oh, okay. No, the, uh, there are. Kelsey Ballerina. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. She played like Thompson Bowling and yeah. it sold out, which kind of blew my mind. Yeah. I, okay, we're going to go, you ready? We're going to go on some spicy takes. Okay. Uh, Casey Musgraves. It, I, I haven't looked yet. I swear to God. it. I'm putting an asterisk by this. If I look down and it says she is not from the South. Okay. okay. I'll give her credit on it. <laughs> Casey, here's a hot take. Which last podcast has me and uh, Lauren uh, saying very unpleasant things about Taylor Swift for like 20 minutes. I think that may have been in part two. You may have not gotten that. I haven't gotten that. Yeah. Taylor Swift, what we both said was Taylor Swift, as a business person, respect the hell out of her. She is not the greatest songwriter ever to live. And the problem is less with her and more with her fans believing that she is the only person in the universe is like not even close like i i have an album in there that i just got yesterday from this guy josh ritter yeah uh, i saw jillian welch and dave rawlings don't you dare say taylor swift is a better I'm better there is a song by jillian welch called look at look at miss ohio that if you really think about it i think is about abortion and mm. it's like Please explain to me how blank space is better than <laughs> that. Stop talking. That's I get I get very angry. Sadly, all over my head. I I'm, I mean I don't know much about yeah. Miss but like Swift, Josh Ritter so. wrote two songs about the history of songwriting, folk bloodbath, and now I'm going to blank on the other uh, bone of song. And I'm like those two songs alone. Better than Taylor Swift's entire catalog. I'm also kind of, I don't know, I'm, I'm not like, I don't, I think having grown up here, you would think, and I've learned this. So the clinical trial is in Nashville and it is really hard to go to Nashville if you don't mm-hmm. like country music because mm-hmm. it's fucking everywhere. Also, Every restaurant you go to is blaring country music. So Taylor Swift is from Pennsylvania. <laughs> like this is my problem is, but my very spicy take on Casey Musgraves. Anytime I have seen her, I was like, this feels like cosplay. This does not feel real. Oh, well, yeah. She she is a very pretty woman that, 
here's I am not he man woman hater at all, <laughs> but it feels like she has gotten a lot because she is a very pretty woman that is sure. cosplaying. And it I was like, it feels inauthentic to me. I was like, Julian Welch, that is a hundred percent authentic. Yeah. That the, you cannot get more real than her and David Rollins. I was like, but people saying like, no, Casey Ro- Casey Musgraves is I was like Casey Chambers from Australia is more of a country person <laughs> than Casey Musgraves. Don't stop. Just stop. Because it looks good on Instagram doesn't make it real. Like that's yeah. my problem. I'm st- I'm like I'm stuck in the eighties and nineties. That's all I don't yeah. I can't do bluegrass and country music and the have you seen the show Yellow Jackets? Do you know what I'm talking about? Too gory. Oh yeah, it's very but I don't like the that. soundtrack. Like oh yeah, this, um, it's got me all like '90s feels. It's okay. yeah. So, I anyway. haven't done this in a while. <laughs> Have I not gotten you to listen to the Midnight? The Midnight mm-hmm. is one of my favorite bands. Okay, they are one of. They are a new band that I think you would like. I will check it out. And here's what it is: because they make their music sound like '80s music. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Surely I've told, and their fans cut. Like uh, Pretty in Pink, the film. I just watched that last night for the first time, if you can believe that. I swear to God, I just watched it last night. It it does not hold up. No. I didn't watch it until the early 2000s. And the whole time I was watching, I was like, this is not good. (laughs) (laughs) Like, is that the one with Long Duck Dong? Yeah. Uh, No, no, no. no, no. no. You're thinking of um, the other John Hughes movie. 16 Candles. 16 Candles, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which I also haven't seen. So I just watched. I watched uh, uh, shit. The one that's the other, the midnight they cut to Saint Elmo's fire. I just watched that like a month ago for the first time. It was horrible, horrible. It, I thought I had seen it, and then I watched it like six months ago. Not one character is likable. They're all really oh, they're terrible all, people. Demi Moore is going to die because she. Uh, she it's too cold in her house, her apartment. <laughs> like it's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Uh, but yeah, here I'm going to bore you with this. Okay. And I realize we're on the clock, and I am You're trying okay. to. <laughs> but I, I actually used to do this a lot more on the podcast, where I would force people to listen to the midnight. As so much that look at that, you can see where I have searched for the midnight. Okay. Uh, but here's the problem. Is that because of these videos, they've made me think some of these old 80s films that I somehow missed were good. They are not good. <laughs> uh, that one's really good. Career Opportunities. Uh, I know that that is a bad film. Uh, that one right there. I see. Oh. We did, I mean, we didn't have. I didn't. We didn't go to the movies. We didn't have cable when I was. So I missed all of this stuff. License to Drive. Where is? Where in the hell is the? Los Angeles is really good, and they cut that to La La Land, and it is, it 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 makes me. Uh, That's something else cry. I've. I don't think I've ever seen the Karate Kid. <gasps> I know. I'm telling you, we didn't. Uh, I, so we were talking you're about. Be, you're as bad as these Gen Zers. <laughs> no. Uh, God, why can I not find it? I'm gonna search Saint Elmo's Fire and see if that'll pull it up. Uh, here's what. There it is. See, look, I even searched for it. That's hilarious. <laughs> Here it is. Uh, before Cobra Kai came out, yeah, the TV show. I'm going to listen back to this and realize I have said the word yeah like a million times. Like the way some people say Do but you know or like. how many times I say mm, mm. <laughs> Cobra, Before Cobra Kai came out, my weirdest, not weirdest movie take, one of my odd movie takes is, I think the three Karate Kid films are a lot better as a trilogy than anybody gives them credit for. Mm, There are so many people now, they're like, like, no, it sucks. I was like, it's kid actors. You got to give it. I was like, but the idea, the first one is great. The second one, the fact that he and Mr. Miyagi went back to Mr. Miyagi, I was like, Uh, spoiler, uh, spoiler. (laughs) Well, no, they, that happens in the first five minutes of the film. Okay. Okay. They go over to Mr. Miyagi's where he grew up. Okay. I was like, that's ballsy to, to take it. It's like back to the future to take it in a completely different direction. And then the third film is, uh, 
a disgraced person from the first film comes back and the third film is a lot darker. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, because the kids who, I was one of the kids, the kids who watched the first film are now older Mm -hmm. and it's a much darker, it's not the Godfather, but for what it is, I actually think those three films are a lot better than people give them credit. I may have seen it. I feel like I, but it's just one of those, it's part of the, just, I I had the biggest crush on Allie in the Karate Kid, Elizabeth, Shoe? Yes. Oh. In The Karate Kid. Oh, my God. Huh? Because I was just the right age. Like, <laughs> so this made me think. I was like, I don't think I've seen Sam Almost Fire. Because I think it was too adult for, well, it was in that. Too adult. And they were like babies say, at the time. It was too adult for me when I was that age. Oh, at the age where dad was showing me Deliverance. Like. And I was like, this. Doc, this. Music video made me think the movie was good, and the movie is not good. It's terrible. Yeah, it was it. it yeah, the the people are all terrible. And it's just. Did you watch the Bratz documentary? Did we already talk? Yeah. We already talked about this. I. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Again, I didn't like it. I, it made me sad for Andrew McCarthy, and I love I Andrew McCarthy, but it just felt like a giant therapy session. Yes. For him, and it felt like the other actors didn't really even want to be talking about this. And they're like, dude, just let it die. And he won't. And yeah. he's just. Although I, I will say, the guy who wrote the article. Yeah. That guy was a real prick. Because he essentially, in that documentary, is like, no, no, no. I'm not wrong. You're wrong. Like, he, it felt like he kept fighting Andrew McCarthy and saying, like, Andrew was like, you were also a young dude. Yeah. And maybe you, like, I think it was like kind of coming out. as was like, you weren't one of the cool kids and you were mad at the cool kids. Basically. And that guy just almost like. Hmm. Dug, yeah, dug his heels in. And yeah. it was just like, holy shit, that dude's also an ass. <laughs> <laughs> but see, okay, so this is the midnight. So it sounds like 80s music to me. Yeah. It's great. This is one of my favorite bands. Like, and I've seen them now live. I think three times and was supposed to go uh, a couple weeks ago and see them in Asheville. And oh, it got canceled that's the, the day yeah. before mm-hmm. where I was in Atlanta when it got canceled. Oh God, this film is so bad. It really was. But th- uh, so whatever his Rob Lowe's character. Yeah. He, he lost boys. He yeah. looks just like the dude from lost boys. Yeah. The what you know the Jason like Patrick. cross earring and the semi mullet oh, haircut. Oh no, you're talking about Emilio Estevez or not Emilio? Uh, shit. No, you had it right. Sutherland. Don't. Oh no, you're talking yeah. about Jason Patrick, the main. Jason guy. Jason Patrick looks. They. I mean, yeah. I guess it was just the '80s thing yeah. that that was the style. So there was somebody I was talking to the other day that had not seen. Who was I talking to that had not seen the Lost Boys? The shirtless, oiled up. Yeah, uh, saxophone player is playing at the open chord soon. Uh, okay. From the Lost Boys, and I was trying to explain, like, <laughs> whoever it was I was sitting with, I was like, "This is going to mean nothing." I looked at him, I was like, "This is going to mean nothing to you, and you're going to say what the fuck when I say these <laughs> words in consecutive order, but you're going to understand what I'm saying." I was like, <laughs> "The shirtless, oiled up saxophone yeah. player is about to play open chord," and that person was like. Why does he have to be oiled up? Why is he? I was like, he just is in the film. I can't explain it. And I pulled up a picture and showed. And they were like, what is this movie? I was like, I think whoever it was, I was like, you will love this movie. <laughs> like it was somebody that it fit. But You're yeah. going to get like copyright. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> they're not going to be able to hear it <laughs> on the podcast. And I've done it so many other times. Oh, okay. But The Midnight is great. I, I love them. I think you have told me about them yeah. before. They are, to... one, they are a band I have tried to tell more people about because it's just like they are have pretty hardcore fans and they have a good following. I swear you were talking about them on one of the podcasts I was listening to on the way to Nashville last time you were talking about them. (laughs) Are you kidding? I've talked about them on dozens of podcasts. (laughs) Like I am trying to always sell when I had the radio show, I tried to sell the midnight a lot because I was like, I'm not kidding you. This band needs a lot more. needs to be a lot more famous. Mm -hmm. Well, it comes down to during the pandemic when, Excuse me, when we had the prayer circle at the Central Collective, where it was like Sean and Joachim and David Harmon and a few of us, mm-hmm. where we get around and smoke cigars like every yeah. Wednesday. Church night. Church night. And then <laughs> we, one of the guys one time was like, 
man, pop music has really made a comeback. And so, and we started talking about bands that were pop bands that we liked. And, and he was like, well, if next time everybody brings like three to five songs uh, and we'll talk about it on the, as we're sitting here just drinking, mm-hmm. I'll bring a good speaker. Sean has a really good like Bluetooth speaker. It's one of those, it's one they do karaoke with. Yeah. So they didn't realize what they were unleashing, unleashing when it came to me. It had to be something <laughs> from within three to three to four years. Uh, I think I have about six hours worth of music. <laughs> and I was like, and I got to go first. And I was like, here's the song. It, here, I was like, here's the song. It's this guy named Child. The song's called Pirouette. A minute in, everybody's like, oh, oh, this wins. This wins. No matter what, this wins. <laughs> this is amazing. And it was so funny. I was like, yeah, you all don't know who you're messing with. <laughs> like, I am not going to play around when it comes to music. <laughs> like, you got to trust me. Music and movies. Jody's got it. Movies. Nailed. It doesn't equate to anything worth a shit. But, uh, okay. Oh, God. Now we're going to a transition into. Okay. Have there been any surprising physical changes that you weren't expecting when you began treatment? Other than the hair thing. Um, The weight loss was more drastic than I was anticipating. Um, okay. And I've been told, well, okay you'll appreciate this and you may already know this that when the surgical oncologist gave me a booklet kind of describing what the surgery was and what I would expect afterwards and like um eating you know diet and stuff like that and um seven days before the surgery I had to do these protein shakes and they're not just protein shakes they've got some kind of special sugar in them that helps prep your pancreas because your pancreas um, controls digestive en- enzymes and also the like hormones that help with like balancing, you know, so, like so you don't get diabetes and stuff like that, oh, right? Okay. So anyway, so I had to drink these shakes for seven days, which were pretty terrible. And he warned me that they were pretty terrible. And he's like, if you just can't do it, then you can do this kind of Gatorade. And if you can't do that, you know, just try and eat certain things. And he was, he was, I just looked at him. I was like, well, how about donuts? Because the um, Kern's food hall had just opened yeah. and had the um, Richie cream donuts in there, which we had just discovered. And he was like, yeah, that works. And he literally wrote in the book, <laughs> like he wrote for RX for donuts. And I was like, I, I'm taking this with me to Richie cream. Don't like, tempt me. <laughs> Don't tempt me. <laughs> so um, he's like, yeah, he's like, but you, you know, you can't like whatever you can do, to, like maintain or gain weight. You, you cannot lose any more weight before the surgery. Um, which was really just from the inability to eat because um, I had a lot of pain with digestion. Yeah. Um, didn't have a lot of appetite. Again, couldn't eat anything cold. Couldn't drink anything cold. Um, so I just gradually throughout the, the months of you know doing chemo kept without trying to lose weight, which is, you know, ironic when I was like paying somebody yeah. for three months to yeah. help me. And I worked my butt off to lose about 20 pounds. Um, but so in the last year from October of 23 through today, I've lost over 60 pounds, which is, holy crap. that's a lot in, yeah. you know, a year's time and obviously not the healthiest way to do it. And some of it was like literal body parts <laughs> yeah. being taken yeah. out. Um, and you don't realize how much weight that is, you know, so, um, so, I mean, it's also weird, like, I'm having to buy all new clothes, because now, especially with the season changing, like, nothing fits, and you try to, you know, you're, you're actually venturing out of the house, and you got to look, well, I'm one of those people who, you know, doesn't go to Walmart in their hey, pajamas, so. Hey. <laughs> I can't go to Walmart. That shit comes I, you know, up and I year. can't, I'm not, that I can't do the Jody short, like, all year. I can't, I can't, I gotta, I, I gotta have Nobody pants, can. jeans, so, yeah. Um, so, it's been kind of a shock buying clothes and sizes that I have never worn in my adult life is, yeah. is a real screws with your head. Um, going from being like a certain size, like a size 16 women's clothing down to a size six. That's a huge change. Yeah. Um, and so I've had to like replace everything, which sounds great. And I guess it is if you like shopping and I don't. Yeah. So yeah. I've, I've now turned in one of those people that I have a table outside my front door with a, a Halloween dish full of Halloween candy, but also like energy squares and drinks and stuff because I have deliveries come into my house constantly where I'm trying to buy new clothes and even my feet have gotten smaller from weight loss. So yeah, it sounds great, but it's really not. 
<laughs> yeah, I was going to say, as someone who does not have this problem, because uh, <laughs> I get online to, online shopping is hard for me, because sizes are not correct. I looked at a, yeah. a hoodie, mm-hmm. and it said a 3XL was a 48-inch chest, and I was like, you are out of your mind. No. Like That's a, like Chinese sizing. And it's, I think it, it was on a fancy website. Oh. Like it was, there's a site, Uncrate, that I love. That's mm-hmm. like, it's guy stuff, but they do clothing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, that's a cool looking sweatshirt. It was a sweatshirt. And I looked at it and it was like $120 or something. I was like, oh, I'm never going to buy this, but this looks really cool. And I looked at it and I was like, 48 inches for a 3XL. You are out of your mind. That's like <laughs> a large, like a 2XL yeah, is 52. It is. Mm-hmm. Like, 48 years. That's a large. I think that jacket I just bought from Amazon because it was on sale during that Prime, Amazon day. Prime October, days. Mm. Prime day that they just had. And I, th- I have to buy 3XLs now and sometimes 3XLs don't fit. And I'm mm. like, that's not me. Like, <laughs> I understand I'm a bigger dude. Yeah. But I've got 2XL shirts from like 2005 in there that yeah, I wear. The sizing like, is different. Like mm-hmm. when I mow and stuff. And I was like... They are looser than this shirt, which is a 2XL tall. Mm-hmm. And this one feels like it's hugging. Like, I feel like it, a sausage casing. <laughs> like, I'm like, what the fuck? It, stop. Let's just all make it standard. Like, mm-hmm. this size from shoulder to shoulder. And then chest size should all be the same on all 2XLs. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So, that's, that's the, biggest, the biggest uh, physical change for me was the, the weight loss. Drastic. So very... Yeah. Did you say shoe size? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, your feet, when you lose oh, yeah, weight, yeah, your feet yeah. also get thinner and, you know, and. Okay. Yeah. So it's gone down like half a size, basically. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's, my, that's, lots of delivery people at my house. My credit card bill is. I, there are times where I'm like, should I, I should do something at Christmas time. <laughs> for, because I have bought a lot of her. I bought. I got to cut back on it, but I don't, it's, Amazon is so easy. Mm-hmm. I know it's I the know. devil. I know. But it's like, uh, I have like three items set on the subscribe and save mm-hmm. because they are so much cheaper. Yeah. And it's so easy to do it. And you can set it up however you want it. Like, it's oatmeal. <coughs> A big box of oatmeal is so insanely cheaper than buying oatmeal at the grocery store yeah and then we get like water filters yeah our for our fridge we get water filters delivered regularly through amazon so yeah that my uh prolisec Mm -hmm. for heartburn Mm -hmm. is so much cheaper and then like breath savers breath mints (laughs) like that's a once every like two months but it's like shit balls i buy like 24 of those and it's cheaper than buying like Mm-hmm. 10 of them yeah. like i know it's the devil i don't care <laughs> i can't care at this point like i gotta save money where i can you know records aren't going to buy themselves <laughs> uh what is something that you wish knew people knew about supporting someone who's going through cancer treatments um i i don't know i mean I had, you know, like I said, a lot of people have reached out that I wouldn't have expected. I was kind of surprised by. Um, I think the better thing is to say that people are going to want to help. People are people are going to want to know what's going on. And they're going to want to know how they can help. And you may not have anything mm-hmm. that you need. But just letting people ask the question and, you know, letting people offer help. Sometimes that is enough to you know they just people just want to help yeah. so even if even if there isn't anything that you need just be okay with like knowing that people are going to ask don't get annoyed uh, which is why we made the group so that the people yeah. that really wanted to know and be kept in the loop i try to go in at least every couple of weeks and say hey you know sorry i've been quiet i've been feeling like crap but here's where we stand you know yeah. um and yeah just accept the help when you can we've had um, people who have been amazing bringing us food. Um, 
we had some friends in Charleston that were like, you know, we like there's this local place that does food like meal delivery. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. Clean Eats, I think is what it's called. Um, And, you know, we want to do that, you know, so that you don't have to worry about cooking and going to the grocery store. And, you know, it's like, that's great, but I really don't have an appetite. You know, we had these all these meals were coming and it was like even with mom there and Tim, we were come the end of the week. We still had so much food because people were bringing stuff over and, you know, it was like really great. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, you just don't have an appetite and you feel bad then when stuff goes to waste, but it, you know, it, was, it made people feel like they were doing something helpful. So yeah. it's like, okay, great. You know? Um, and then just, you know, like I said, you know, family members having my mom there was, has been such a tremendous help. And, you know, that's been the biggest thing that I needed was stuff I couldn't do. I didn't have the energy to like strip the bed and carry a basket of laundry up and down the stairs. Deal, deal with a furry Muppet. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially when he decides that, you know, he's got to do the zoomies and run circles around you in the front yard. Yeah. And I'm like too dizzy to, yeah, that's, that's been the heartbreaking thing to me was we had just rescued this dog and, or got him from a rescue, hadn't had him a couple, hadn't even had him six months when yeah. all this happened. And I feel like he's been a lifesaver for me, but I feel like he's gotten the short end of the stick because we haven't been able to take him out and socialize him like we wanted to. So we're, we're doing that now. Um, and fortunately, he's a very good dog. He's the best dog. I'm trying to find, I still have a photo that eventually I need to post. From November 14th, 2023, of when I came over and we sat on the back porch. Look at the baby. I was like, I have this favorites to where I'm like, all of this is shit I need to eventually post. And it's like, holy shit, that's from November 2023. And I still have not posted. It's like, one of these days, y'all are going to randomly get tagged on Instagram. He's the best. And I had dogs is one of the things I had written down. So when you were going with your mom to chemo, did you ever see a therapy dog there? Yeah. Okay. This was when I took her. Was she at UT? Was she going to UT? No. Okay. It was 2007, 2008. She was going to a breast cancer place on shit balls. <laughs> What is the road that the main post office is on? Oh, Weisgarber. Weisgarber. Mm-hmm. So in behind the, the Weigels, mm-hmm. there was a, yeah. in just a strip, there was a breast cancer treatment. And that's yeah. where I would take her to, to uh, her chemo. Yeah. There are a lot of cancer remember specialist where, places now. I can't remember where like her actual like hospital or doc. I can't remember if it was UT or Fort Sanders. Mm-hmm. Dad well, would know. She went to UT a lot later yeah. on when she had heart issues. So I would assume it was UT. Yeah, it was UT because it's in that first tall building uh, when you went over there where the offices were. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, so it was mm-hmm. UT. Um, so Guinness is the name of uh, one of the therapy dogs that is at UT at least once a week, and he's a golden retriever uh, that was rescued from Turkey. A- apparently, goldens are a thing over there. They breed them a lot. Um, and somehow I, I, I don't know, or overrun with them. And so there's a group here, there's a, a golden rescue group here in town. I don't know if they're affiliated, but that's where he came from, um, yeah. he, from Turkey a couple of years ago. And he's like the most chill, mellow creature you have ever seen. He's just this big, beautiful golden baby. And he comes in and yeah, his name's Guinness. And he comes in and he just like flops down at the feet of at at every chemo chair and that to me like it's something that I knew existed you know therapy dogs obviously is a thing but being in the position of being in a chair and being injected with this horrible awful medication that just makes you feel like shit and then you see this dog come walking in like it's it just totally changes your mood you forget for that little short window of time like you forget that you're connected to all of these nasty bags of radioactive goop you know and he, this, he's just the best. And there's also a um, miniature Aussie now that we've seen um, that goes into like the breast cancer center at UT. I think and, it's the difference uh, in 2008 and 2023. You think? I mean, I, it, I think it wasn't as, as big, maybe as big a thing in Knoxville. Let's yeah. Say, well, as opposed to like, you know, California or New York may have had stuff like that, but Knoxville. Yeah. 
I I would love because Barkley is our dog is so he is such a social creature and he loves people. I walked him this morning and there was a lady from down the street out walking and he just like digs his heels in and refuses to move until he gets to say hello. <laughs> I mean, and he's a 25 pound dog and I can't make him budge. Yeah. It's like, it's ridiculous. Uh, and he got so excited and was jumping all over her. And I'm like, this would be the perfect thing for him. And I, I genuinely want to figure out like what all the rules are and yeah. get him that particular kind of training so that he could be a therapy dog because I think he would love it. And I know how much it meant to me. And I think it would be so cool to be able to do that. Yeah. Totally. So, uh, goals. <laughs> goal, hashtag goals. <laughs> I think we can of talked about surgery. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the trials now. Yeah. Um, so, mm, it's like 95% of people that are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer have some kind of genetic mutation. Um, but then there's this subset of people that it's less than 5% of those 95% have a very specific mutation that's a KRAS, K-R-A-S mutation. And I happen to be one of those less than 5% of people with pancreatic okay. cancer that has this KRAS uh, mutation. And so long story short, some people in the science world um, kind of like pinpointed this specific KRAS mutation and figured out that what it does is it gives cancer the ability to grow it, it opens pathways for the cancer to grow and spread mm-hmm. that other cancers don't. So, cause pancreatic cancer can be slow growing, which is why it's hard to diagnose. Um, I mean, you can have pancreatic cancer for years and not know it. It's until it becomes problematic. Like in my case where it was blocking the bile ducts or, um, it spreads to the liver, um, perhaps, um, or the lungs, it's still pancreatic cancer, even though it has spread to a different location. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, um, this particular mutation causes the cancer to basically grow uncontrolled. And so they figured, they figured that out and they said, okay, so we now have like pinpointed this particular mutation and we know what it does. Can we figure out a way to stop it? And so even though it's such a small group of people, 5%, they, they were like, let's start with this. If we can figure out how to make it work in this group of people because we have this weird gene, this weird genetic mutation, then maybe we can do something with it. And so um, there is a drug called Crizati. Um, Adagrasib is the, the name of it. Um, anyway, that's, that's what it does. It targets that specific genetic mutation, and it basically shuts down the pathways. And okay. So the cancer, it's not a cure, um, it's I think there's been like one person that had no sign of cancer after they started taking it. Um, but um, it's only an option after you've gone through all of the other stuff like chemo and surgery and the cancer is still present, which in my case it was um, after the surgery, the pathology team, you know, everything they take out of you gets all spliced and diced and looked at under a microscope and tested. And they said that I had um, 30 lymph nodes were removed and eight of those lymph nodes tested positive for cancer. Um, and since then, with, you know, follow up scans, they've found a lesion on my liver, um, which, again, is pancreatic cancer that just has spread to the liver. Um, but. It's actually a good thing in this case because the clinical trial needed something quantifiable. They needed they needed a lesion somewhere and it had to be at least a centimeter in order to qualify. And that way they can monitor it and see if it – does it stay the same? Does it get bigger? Does it get smaller? Um, okay. So this lesion actually – enabled me to take part in this clinical trial. And so they're monitoring that in addition to other things like that CA199 number, the the tumor marker in your blood, you know, they, they keep track of that too. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm taking the adagrasive, which just got cleared by the FDA back in June, um, primarily for certain types of lung cancer and colorectal cancer, but they're finding that it also does good in some people um, with pancreatic cancer. And it's at which hospital? Um, it's, I'm going to a, a cancer research institute in Nashville called okay. Sarah Cannon, um, that my doctor here at UT, um, connected with her, um, the, the doctor that's in charge of this trial. Um, and I verified that I'm, I can talk about it. It's not a double blind study or anything. Yeah. So, um, but it is because pancreatic cancer, even though it's one of the top, um, 
cancers. It's like in the top 10 cancers uh, in the U.S. And it's like the third leading cause of um, oh. da- cancer death in the U.S. But it's still kind of small compared to like breast cancer. Yeah. Um, and long, I assume. And what? Long. Yeah. Um, smoking. <laughs> yeah, lung cancer. Yes. Lung cancer. Um, and um, actually it's lung cancer and I think colon cancer. Oh, yeah. Um, but it yes, it has the highest mortality rate of all major cancers. Wow. And is the third leading cause of cancer deaths in the U.S. after lung and colon cancer. Yes. I wrote that down. Wow. So, yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, I'm one of the rare under 5% of people with pancreatic cancer with this gene that they've now targeted with the Adagrasib, uh, drug that the FDA has approved, but they're also testing it with another drug that is as yet unnamed. Um, this trial is the first time that it's been used in humans. So they're basing their, the theory that these two drugs will work together based on the success that they've had with like lab creatures mm. um so yeah so that was a little uh, disconcerting knowing that i'm gonna be taking a drug that hasn't actually been tested in humans yet <laughs> and the whole point obviously they're you know the two drugs together they want to know how well they work so they're testing the efficacy of the two drugs together but they're also trying to figure out dosage levels okay so going into it knowing that they don't know how much they can give you without making you sick like yeah. that's kind of the point is they want you to get sick and come to them and be like, I, we got to dial this back. So I knew going into it that I was going to have symptoms and, and side effects from the drugs. And at some point I assume they're going to up the dosage and keep doing that until I go to them and say, Hey, <laughs> I can't, this isn't tolerable anymore. And that was one of my first questions to them was like, define tolerable. Yeah. Like, I work from home, so I don't have to worry about like, being in an office environment and I got to go to the bathroom for whatever, you know, yeah. I'd spend half an hour in the bathroom at that, that I don't have that. So my, my tolerance level may be more than the average person. So tell me, tell me what, when do I, pull? when you also don't cry. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, I don't on. cry. <laughs> oh, I have, I have a lot. There have been, there was one instance we were just, Tim said to me last night, he's like, you really didn't have a lot of vomiting with the chemo. Mm-hmm. Like, everybody made me think that it was going to be really, really bad. I only threw up once the whole time, but that day was, it was real bad. And it took mom and Tim both. I literally was like glued to the bathroom floor. They had to pick me up off the floor and practically carry me into the bedroom because I was so sick. That's the sickest I've ever been in my life. Mm. And at that point we started kind of tweaking the chemo. They, they dialed it back about 10%. um, And they started giving me fluids at the end of each treatment to help also to like flush some of that stuff out of my system and boost my levels back up. And I started getting like blood infusions and stuff too. So Ooh, all the around things. Halloween, yeah. you're getting blood infusions. <laughs> uh, did you tell them like, look, I also don't cry and I'm seeing this as an, I'm seeing the end. So my tolerance level also, my, <laughs> you're yeah. giving them all these like, well that, you know, so I said the, the goalpost kept moving because I, yeah. I, the drain kept having to get changed. I, Oh, and when you have cancer, if you get a fever over like a hundred, 100.4, you have to go to the emergency room, which okay. is not like super high. So, I mean, you're constantly taking your temperature and there were several times I, I got some sort of basically like a cold, which is weird because nobody else in the house got sick, but you're just super susceptible yeah. to stuff. You got to go to the emergency room and you, you know, you're in three or four days in the hospital and it just changes your schedule. Yeah. And so the goalposts kept getting pushed back and back and back. So that light at the end of the tunnel, when we first started this and we, we were like, okay, we just got to make it to September. And then it got pushed back and pushed back. So and which sucks for the trial. How long does the trial last? Well, I don't know yet. It'll probably be at least a year. Um, I've been, I think I'm coming up on my third week of taking the drugs. Um, and then, then after six weeks, so the middle of November, I'll go in and have new scans. They'll do a CT scan an MRI and a bone scan to see if anything has changed. If are there any new lesions, um, the existing lesions, have they changed in any way? Um, if things are working, if there's nothing new, if things are shrinking, then I'll continue on the trial for about a year. 
Okay. Um, but if not, then we'll have to see if there are other trials that I'm eligible for, or we'll have to go back to doing chemo. And the cancer responded to the chemo initially. Um, the tumor shrank. It went from like, you know, the it, four centimeters, whatever it was, down to like two. But in that window of time that I had to stop doing chemo before surgery, it grew back, went up to five centimeters. Because of this KRAS mutation, it just yeah. it just grew uncontrolled, unchecked in that short six week span of time, and it spread to the lymph nodes and the liver. Um, so, and then again after surgery, you know, you can't have chemo for a while. So there mm-hmm. was there were like three months. There was a three month window where I had no treatment. I had surgery, no chemo, and so it spread and and grew back. So um, it it does it is responsive, but you know you can't. You can't do chemo forever, so. Uh, in the going to Nashville for the trials, mm-hmm. is Weekly. that a day and back, or do you have to stay the night in case anything goes wrong because you're drained? Uh, well, no, the drain. I'm sorry, the drain got removed. Not when, drained, tight. Oh, tired. Sorry, let me. Yeah. See, let well, me no, I should say, yeah, the drain got removed when we did surgery. Thank God, I don't, I don't, don't have to. Yeah, yeah. That was um, one for the listener at home. I may have made threats and texts that yeah. the text got cleaned up a lot for me. Going, I, was, where, I will knock the mother. mother. <laughs> yeah. What do we have to do to get you a drain that actually works? Yeah. It's like, do I need to show up and hold this doctor <laughs> by their ankles <laughs> off the tall building and say, you're going to fix this? Yeah. Um. So the, yeah, the drain's gone. Thank God. Um, and I take two pills, I'm sorry, three pills twice a day. Um, on the days that I have to be in Nashville, I don't take the pills until I go there. They, they, I have to go in fasting. They draw blood just to see how everything is from a fasting standpoint. Then they give me the pills and they draw blood again. And it kind of alternates like this next week when I go, um, they'll do blood draws every hour till like three o'clock in the afternoon, which Jesus. sucks. Yeah. Um, So I'll get to eat and then they'll check my blood and they'll check it again in an hour, an hour. And then the next time I go, they basically are just doing like an EKG um, and one blood draw because the meds can mess with your, um, the rhythm of your heart. So they got to make sure that that's not happening. Um, And then for whatever reason, I'm also um, anemic right now. So they're going to give me, yeah, my hemoglobin is low. So they're going to give me some, a blood infusion, iron infusion when I'm there next week. So it varies. Um, but the place is super nice. The people there are are great and I'm actually working. I went back to work two weeks ago. So I take my laptop with me and my boss is like, he's a saint among men. And he's like, you just do what you got to do. And if you're not feeling up to it, just let me know. Cause I don't want to be bothering you. You know, if you're not feeling good or if you're, you know, busy with, you know, clinic stuff, just let me know. Does your mom or Tim go with you to Nashville? Yeah. Well, they've both been with me. Tim went with me once. Um, My mom's been with me a couple times just in case I do, like you said, get the feeling drained. It's such a, that's such a a bitch of a drive. Well, I mean, mean, I'm used to, we, we had a, you know, the place on Folly Beach was like a six hour drive. I know, but you also didn't have cancer at that time. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, I'm just. No, I mean, it, usually it's not too bad. This last time I was having some digestive issues and which is how we ended up at Bucky's because I was like, we stopped at one place in some little podunk town and the bathroom was like, it's one of those where it's like outside, you got to have a key. And oh, yeah. I, uh, there was a dude sitting on a, like a pickle bucket outside the bathroom door. I was like, no, I'm not. No, like keep going. Yeah. And we got back on the interstate and there was a sign for Bucky's and I was like, oh shit. All right. Yeah, let's. It's hilarious because you're the one who took me to I Bucky's know. for the first time. <laughs> and now I'm the one that goes every time. This last time I came back from, well, I came back from Atlanta. That was uh, the first time I had not stopped at a Bucky's <laughs> when going to Nashville. You're always back, posting pictures from Bucky's. Or Atlanta. Because like... I, I think it's funny. <laughs> and there's a side reason that I will tell you off my Okay. Uh, yeah. I got to wrap that that one down they too. do have the cleanest bathrooms and it, it blows my mind that they some it, it, that is someone's job I don't know about the men's room but in the women's room there is a person who her sole job is just to tell you which bathrooms are available 
and no. to keep the line moving. There's not in the men's room. No. She and because they had a sign out front, like you know, hiring there, for. There's urinals. So you can see. Oh, okay. So you yeah, can see. There's urinals well, down one okay. wall, and then the other three walls are all toilets. Okay. Well, so, no, we have we have a yeah. we have an attendant in in the Bucky's women's room. So, just so. Uh, I did not. I gotta tell you why I did not. Because <laughs> here, maybe you'll know this. I I rented a car for the first time in forever. And you had to set a time that you would come back. Yeah. So I set mine for 4 p.m. Well, I left Atlanta early enough to where that shouldn't have been a problem, but just got stuck between going to Marietta, Mm -hmm. eating. Mm -hmm. That's also my new, I think I told you, my new hack Mm -hmm. for anybody listening. When you are leaving town, (laughs) go to Marietta and eat. Because Marietta is awesome. It's a beautiful little downtown. A lot of good restaurants. I'm two for two. And you don't have to pay to park. And you don't have to pay to park. I'm <laughs> actually, I'm going to put in the coffee shop too. I'm three for three in Mar. No, four for four in Marietta. I went to the Australian bakery. Uh, oh. Yeah, <clears throat> it was good. Uh, but in coming back, it was such a pain in the ass. Traffic was worse because when you leave Atlanta, it's usually pretty bad for the first like 30 minutes outside of Atlanta. Then it eases up a little bit. It never eased up. Mm-hmm. Like it did not ease up until past Chattanooga Mm -hmm. and I was like up against but when I went to go to the Bucky's I was like I'm like one mile away why is it saying it's going to take me 15 minutes to get there Uh, Uh the exit was backed up onto the interstate and I was like to go to Bucky's to go to Bucky's I was like screw that and I just I actually exited and I was like I ain't got that kind of time and then just blew (laughs) past all them immediately got on the interstate and found like the next place that was a truck stop and use the bathroom and grab some Bucky's stuff. Bucky's is, you could do a whole podcast just about Bucky's because yeah. it's just, it's insanity. And seventh uh, with, ring of hell, in my opinion. But In yes. my defense. <laughs> with very clean bathrooms. A lot of the times <laughs> I go, it'll be like one in the morning. Well, And yeah. no one is there. Yeah. And it's awesome. And I can't remember who I was. I was coming back with, it was either Chris or Gary. And I was like, you know, everybody craps on this for how busy and stuff they are. Look at this. It's amazing because there was, I'm not kidding, there was maybe 12 people in the entire place Yeah, because it was like one or two a.m. I think that was after the idol show. Okay, okay. 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 I got to blow through because we were past your time when you said you needed to leave. So Sorry. No, no, no. Uh, Fuck. Okay, I got some deep questions, but (laughs) has going through the experience changed your perspective on life? Um, Wow. Uh, not in some profound way like you probably would expect it to. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we still do what we always did. And, you know, we kind of have this routine, like you work till five, you know, take the dog for a walk, feed the dog, have dinner. And then, you know, eight o'clock, we sit down and watch something on Netflix or whatever. That's yeah. just kind of always been our MO. And we still do that. I'm not out. Well, and part of it too is I can't like, yeah. I still have to be cautious about being around people. I'm still immunocompromised. Um, so like, you know, the Beetlejuice movie, I was so desperate to go see it. And I, I thought that I would take the risk and mask up and go to a theater. And I just, well, then it came out. You could get it on Amazon okay, Prime. Already? Yeah. Okay. So we, we rented it on Amazon Prime and I'm so glad. That, <clears throat> spoiler alert. So glad I, that I, I didn't heard, go to a theater I've heard. to see it. <laughs> but heard. um, I mean, I don't know. I, I was thinking about this because I had... I suspected you would ask something like this. And I think the one thing that has hit me lately is the thought that you're probably not going to get, you're not going to, you're not ever going to be old, which is a weird thing to think about. Okay. I mean, I would love to be like Walter where 20 some odd years after the fact, you're still alive and kicking. And you know, he manages, he he owns a a company in, in Georgia and he's still working in uh, like a, a alcohol distribution company. Have you got to meet Walter? No, not yet. I okay. hope to, um, but, um, or I said, Walter, it's Howard. I don't Howard. know why I always do that. Well, when you said Walter, but, I was like, Walter, Walter why? you're no. going to start making meth. What the <laughs> hell, Stephanie? Uh, don't say that. This Howard. is an incriminating. You're worried about me playing the mid down in the background. You're talking about making yeah. meth. I mean, geez. Um, sorry. I no, I would love to, to be one of those statistics. Um, and that's kind of the, the weird thing about all of this is you hear the statistics, but you have to keep in mind that I am not the typical, pancreatic cancer patient i'm significantly younger decades younger than most people that are diagnosed with this disease um so far healthier 
um, which, you know, has influenced a lot of the decisions that they've made in how to treat it. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's weird to think that, you know, I may not live to see eighties, but that, you know, but then I, I don't like dwell on that because anybody, you know, you could get hit by a bus tomorrow. You just don't know. So I, I guess just like I, I haven't cried over the diagnosis. I've cried plenty about feeling like crap, but um, I haven't, I haven't felt the need to like change anything drastically about my life because I just don't know what's going to happen, you know? Right. And having that sense of normalcy is also nice and feeling up to like, you know, going to get burgers and then come home and watch Netflix. And yeah. I, it's, it's nice to, to, I don't, I don't feel the need to go out and do something drastic Yeah. or, or like, take up some new hobby bungee diving I don't, bungee know. jumping Mm-mm, no although okay. my boss did say to me sorry I'm like screaming um my boss was like you know do you have any like bucket list trips that you want to do you know and, and he's like you need to take time off to go do stuff like that bucket list type stuff and i'm like well that's kind of morbid but thanks you know yeah <laughs> but i mean i get where he's coming from and so we've kind of been talking about it and like you know are there trips that we want to try to do now that we might not have planned to do this soon and um are there and i've been I, I, we compare it to like going to cancun like how much money would we have spent if we went to cancun for dinner you get two meals and a couple margaritas you know it's a hundred bucks actually cancun no no, no 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 like going to the restaurant because we used to go to cancun like at least once a yeah. night or two a week right and so now it's like i see this thing and i want it should i buy it because I don't know if I, how long I'll be around to enjoy it. But then it's also like, well, that's just one Cancun. You know, how many Cancuns did I not get Holy to go shit. for the last eight, nine months? I didn't get to do anything. I wasn't buying clothes. We weren't going out to dinner. We weren't going to the movies. We were, I wasn't shopping. I wasn't doing anything. All this money that I could have spent, things I could have been doing, we didn't do for eight, nine months. And so now it's like I went through this period of like Halloween. I wasn't going to decorate for Halloween. And I... I love Halloween. It's my favorite yeah. holiday. And we did go to a couple of places and look at Halloween stuff. And I saw things that I wanted to buy. And it's like, what's the point? And then I thought, well, that's shitty attitude. Yeah. I mean. I was going to say, you it. and I have the opposite. Where it's like <laughs> uh, a thing that has come up in therapy. The therapist has said to me is, what brings you joy? Yeah. And it's like going to all these shows. And I've had people at work be like, you go to a lot of shows. I was like, yeah. Because I like it. Yeah. Leave me the fuck. Yeah. Like, I come here to work so I can afford to. So you can go do that. Buy the yeah. records and buy the books and do the shit I w- yeah. and travel and go to the shit. Fuck off. <laughs> like, I well, got I, no, I got, I'm not married. I ain't got any kids. See? That's, yeah, the whole. I don't look yeah. at it as yeah. this is one Monterey. I'm like, no, this is going to bring me happiness. Yeah. And, well, I did. I yeah. decorated. So, I, so that's me fussing at you. <laughs> come on. Come on. Why? Well, I, I, well, last year. Before yep. all this, I think it was last year. Before all, before any of this started, I gave I had a ton of Halloween decor that I gave to my sister and brother in law because we don't get trick or treaters, and it's like, what's the point, you know? And they got kids, and they do, and they live in this neighborhood where every they have like contests and stuff. Yeah. So, I gave her most of the stuff. I kept a few things, and it was like we were going to decorate the back, the screen and porch on the back of the house. I was like, oh, fuck that. So I decorated the. Uh, fireplace and put all my stuff there but then I ended up buying stuff for outside (laughs) yeah and and I've been decorating outside too and like yeah I may be around next year to enjoy it I might not but why should I why should I wait and and see well the one thing I would say you got to say for is you know you got to get the bumble I mean (laughs) yeah so what's funny is the first time I looked at that photo I did not notice Tim you didn't see Tim standing there and then I, I looked at it again I was like whoa Whoa. The thing is gigantic. It's ridiculous. That's five, six hundred dollars. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, was there a turning? Has there been a turning point in the treatment where you felt more hopeful or empowered? Um, uh, with the clinical trial, yes. Um, post surgery, we all we did not get the news that we wanted when you know pathology came back and said. You know, it's in eight of the lymph nodes. Um, and then, you know, the C- follow-up CT scans after surgery showed lesions on the liver. That's not the news that anybody wants. Um, but 
again, I know people um, like there's a woman, I believe her name is Kay Keys, and she has had pancreatic cancer for over 30 years and has had it um, like had to have part of her um, like one of the lower lobes of her lungs had to be removed. And I mean, so it's possible to live for a very long time. It's, it's obviously again, statistics. It's not typical, but I'm not typical. And that's what I keep telling myself. And that's what the doctors keep saying. Um, I'm not typical. I'm young. I was healthy when all this happened. So I've got that going for me, but you know, that only, that's only good to a point when you get to the point where treatment's no longer working. And obviously the cancer, I have to be doing chemo. I have to be doing something. Otherwise it's just going to go unchecked and it's just going to go crazy. Yeah. So, um, again, that was not what we were hoping for, but because I'm this freak in the 5% that has this weird genetic mutation, that's what's made me eligible for this clinical trial. And the fear of all of the unknowns about the clinical trial, you know, gave me just a moment of pause, but then realizing that this may be the only option, real good option that I have. Yeah. And while I know that it's going to suck and there's going to be some shitty things about it, like side effects and stuff, I'm helping future pancreatic cancer patients by doing this. Okay. So. All right. I swear. I'm getting you out of here. I got just a few more. Okay. Do you know, so this is something you kind of already touched on, but you don't have to answer for sure. Just like you have that idea. What's, I had to put down what's the first or something big you want to experience after the treatments are complete. So that would fall under, I guess, your bucket, bucket list, list with you. But you don't know what that is yet. I mean, there's places that we've talked about going for years, Italy and Germany. And um, the Bucky's in Kentucky. <laughs> um, but nothing has moved to the front of the list, okay. really. Um, and... You know, like I said, I've been shopping with abandon when it comes to clothes because this is the first time in my life that things actually fit and look good. And I don't feel like I'm having to like hide myself in my yeah. clothes and stuff. So that's been that's been interesting Okay. <laughs> and, and it's kind of fun sometimes, not always, but kind of fun getting into fashion when I've never been. <laughs> so <laughs> that stupid. I don't, I'm sure you've seen it. That jacket I have that has the. It's like uh, corduroy and has the wool mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I got that. And I was like, and I was talking to somebody that you know. And I put, I had that jacket. And I was like, this makes me feel better about myself because I feel like I took a chance on something that I wouldn't normally. Mm-hmm. And this person looked at me and said, oh, this is not taking a chance. And I was like, for me it is. Yeah. How about, it's not about you, it's about me. And uh, I think you might know who that person was. Yeah. And was kind of shitty about it. And I was like, okay, well, I was feeling myself until like 10 seconds ago when you decided that oh. this was dog shit. Uh, <laughs> so, and I keep looking for more jackets like that, but they're also short. Mm-hmm. It's like, I can't, I can't buy this. Yeah. Like, it's not the style of the coat. I love it, but it's not built right for me. Mm -hmm. I'm too tall. So, anyway. Uh, Absolute opposite problem over here coming from somebody who's barely 5'3". Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's... And I I have the extra long torso. Like, pants are like a 33 inseam. Now, I know on men it's different because it measures from the inside. and women, it measures from the outside. But 33 for somebody my height is very... Is not normal. So extra tall, like mm-hmm. my body length from my here to like where my belt is, is like 30, is like this, it's like 33. <laughs> it's so, anyway. anyway. Uh, what advice would you give someone just starting their cancer journey? Oh, um, well, like I said, accept the help. You're going to have lots of people that want to help and you may not know what, they can do or how they can help, but at least, you know, give them the option to, to offer help. Mm -hmm. Um, look into whatever resources are available. Um, it took (laughs) again, many months into this before I found out that there was an integrative health department that offered the things like acupuncture and stuff like that. So ask your doctors what 
what is available to you. Yeah. Um, and they have counselors um, on staff as well. I just have not felt the need to to utilize that service at this point. But so ask what's available to you. Ask if there is a special room in the emergency room. Yes. <laughs> ask ask if there's a special room uh yeah use the heating pads if necessary um i found out things i mean just random stuff like your um the the scar the where the incision was um was extremely sensitive and it still is um even this many months later um and i talked to a friend of mine who um is a physician's assistant and she, she told me, she's like, you can just like, you know, rub it like with a dry towel and kind of tap it and it'll help like kind of those like make those nerves chill out basically okay. by stimulating it. Eventually the nerves just kind of chill out. And I was like, well, that's, I mean, that's another thing that you would think that this is something they would give you on the packet that they send you yes. home with to tell you that you're going to have like an irritated incision and, yeah. you know, this is something you can do to help that. And there no there wasn't anything there, you know, so just if you have issues, if you have pain or you have any kind of symptoms, don't hesitate to ask your doctor or yeah. talk to other people about it because you never know what somebody's going to volunteer and you'll be going, well, that's useless information for me now, Yeah, <laughs> but well, could be helpful helped. to somebody else. Yeah. So, okay. And, you know, the resources, you know, there are even, you know, Susan G. Komen, it's not all bad. Yeah. You know, there there is useful information there and services and resources. Okay. Okay. I'm holding up how many questions I have left. Okay. If there's one thing you could share, one message to people that may not have a, an understanding of cancer treatment, like so it wouldn't be the you or wouldn't be somebody having cancer, it would be one of those support people. What's something you would tell them? Um, I guess just bear with them that, okay. you know, I mean, I think about, you know, mom and Tim and, and everybody, I mean, my sister, you, I mean, these people, I I, I well, no, <laughs> you do. I mean, Joe, okay. Nope, nope, I'll cut all this out. Uh, How dare you? Jody checks in with me every How week. Dare you? He set a reminder on his calendar every Wednesday. Jody sends me a text message to ask how I'm doing because that's the kind of guy that he is. This is literally <laughs> the least I can do. But it, that is, you have no idea, and I'm not going to cry, Oprah. <laughs> you, <laughs> it's like we got one question left. <laughs> By God, I'm going to get you to cry. <laughs> uh, you, you don't, you really, you don't know how much it means to. to for people to to reach out especially like that just i mean i may feel the same i may feel like shit yeah. every week and i may have the same answer for you i i feel like shit i feel like shit but the day's going to come where i don't feel like shit and i'm going to feel happy to tell you okay. that I, i'm having a good week and you know and it gives me an opportunity to see how you're doing oh. and you Mine know even this. if even <laughs> if you're like same I, response every time. i'm at bucky's go figure yeah. you know <laughs> Mine is always at work, same old bullshit, really tired. <laughs> there, there were there were plenty of times, you know, while I may not have cried over the diagnosis, there were plenty of times that I got all up in my feels and was depressed as hell. And just, you know, the, every time the goalpost moved, you know, it's, it's brutal. It really yeah. is. But I knew, you know, every week I was going to get a check in from Jody and, you know, other people. And even though there wasn't anything I could tell them there's not anything that they could do the fact that they were just checking in yeah. means more than it means more than you can know okay. honestly i think that's why hannah is willing to kill for my friend hannah minocchio up in oh shit i shouldn't have named her <laughs> up in cleveland why she's ready to kill for me because every monday like it started very early on in the pandemic we were just lightly friends and then some reason i texted her randomly on a monday like how is this Affecting you like the pandemic and she kind of unloaded. I was mm -hmm. like, all right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a calendar reminder and every Monday I'm going to text you and mm -hmm. check how you're doing. And I have not missed a Monday. Oh. Not only that, there was one time I went to Cleveland. Excuse me. I got there Monday night 
and was sitting in my Airbnb two doors down from the Christmas story house. <laughs> she was at her house and I still texted her. <laughs> her. I was like, I'm going to know I'm going to see your ass tomorrow, but I ain't missing a fucking Monday, man. There has been a time or two where she has texted me before I texted her. But I also think that's why, you know, when it comes to, uh, let's just say the, a certain woman that I dated mm-hmm. in recent history, mm-hmm. uh, Hannah, uh, uh, it is when her and Kevin come down here, it's going to take a lot for me to keep her <laughs> not from finding that mm-hmm. person and physically harming that person yeah. for how they treated me. And uh, that's got to be born out of that. We, we, we text a lot. <laughs> All it took was one once a week. Just how are you doing? How's mm-hmm. this week going? How? Yeah, I feel like that doesn't take people it's a very simple thing, it, the, but the you less, really, you just have no idea I, how meaningful to, it is. I'm trying to get down to the therapist in the last therapy meeting. I broke down because they'll never listen to this. The person I used to go see in Atlanta, I mm-hmm. broke down that entire story mm-hmm. and his thing. He kept saying to me, I was like, I feel bad. Like maybe I shouldn't be taking this. You know, they just stopped responding to me. And he looked at me, he's like, they got te- time to stream, they got time to text you back. <laughs> and he was like, if they got time to, if they're pulling up a YouTube video, they have time to text you mm-hmm. back. It is zero excuse for them not getting back to you. 100%. And, and, and it was just, it was nice to hear that from somebody who has no skin in the game. Yeah. He has zero skin in the game. Mm-hmm. He was like, nope, you're right. That's what, I was like, that makes me feel this much less crazy. Yeah. Because I can't tell you how much being in my head, it feels like. Because I still bet all the money in my wallet that that person would be like, I don't know, I just stopped hearing from Jody. I was like, no, you stopped the other responding way to me. Yeah. A relationship is two ways. Mm-hmm. Anyway, mm-hmm. last question. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to share that we haven't touched on? Is there anything in your notes that I missed? Um, I, I mean, oh. I mean, we covered talking about the midnight. We cover talking about sorted lives. I mean, all the important. <laughs> we talk about Bucky's. I mean, mm-hmm. that's the trifecta. That's the hat trick right there. Um, n- no, I mean, uh, well, okay. So I did. I did tell you that I wanted to do sort of like a call to action, which is I will say that if anybody has things laying around like um, adult coloring books. Yeah. It's something that, you know, we're all the craze for a while. Yeah. Like, you know, everybody that I worked with when I was at the law firm, everybody had coloring books yeah. and, and they still make them. And um, things like that, coloring books and um, like, uh, you know, word search things, you know, those type of like activity Sudoku. books, Sudoku, stuff like yeah. that. Um, hats and bandanas and things. So when I go to when I was getting chemo and now when I go to the clinical trial office you've got not only the people that are getting the treatment but their families come with them and there's just not really much to do you're just sitting there for hours on end so uh, when I go back this week I have a bunch of coloring books that I haven't touched and I've got some colored pencils and stuff so I'm going to take those I'm going to donate them um, okay at the the cancer center Um, and they all of these places also have somewhere it's been my experience they all have a box full of donated hats and bandanas and things for people that have lost their hair. So if anybody has stuff that they want, I mean, I know that people are taking clothing donations and whatnot for the, you know, hurricane right now. But at any point in time, if anybody's got stuff that, you know, they can reach out to me and I'm happy to take stuff to UT and the cancer um, research Institute. And there is somebody in town that makes wigs for people without charging. And yeah. I can't remember what that's called, but, and it's near where Wise Garber, that's the name of that road that uh-huh. I was thinking of. <laughs> Put a pin in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, it. I think it's somewhere around there because mom, I think, got a wig mm-hmm. and there was a point where I was going to do something to raise money mm-hmm. for breast cancer. And she was like, do not go to Susan G. Komen. Yeah. Wigs. Um, there is, you just reminded me, there's also um, uh, someone that we both know recommended um a group that's the they're called chemo angels that's oh, right yeah. uh chemo angels and um you can I, google it um and they it's just a group of people that volunteer to send cards and letters to cancer patients and you sign up through their website and you get assigned to chemo angels um I have one in Louisiana and one in Texas oh. and they send you a card every week 
Um, just, and you don't have to, you don't have to write back. There's no pressure. They just are, you know, checking in. It's a in. physical letter or email? Yeah. No, it's an actual card. You get an actual card That's or cool. postcard or something in the mail. Um, and they tell you a little bit about themselves and their family. And some of them are also cancer survivors. Um, I have one, the lady in Louisiana is a breast cancer survivor. The other, the woman in Texas, I don't think has ever had cancer, but, um, so yeah, they're, they're, um, the rule is they have to send their um, person a card or a letter every week. Um, and I have to check in with the group um, once a month and let them know how I'm doing and okay. where I'm at in treatment and stuff. Um, and then when it came time for me to have surgery, I let them know I've had to stop chemo um, because I'm getting ready to have surgery. And then we'll have four more rounds after um, surgery. Mm-hmm. And what I didn't expect was, I got hundreds of cards and letters, not just from my two angels, but angels from all over the country sent me letters ahead of my surgery, wishing me well, which was just, I I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't know it was going to happen. Um, and it was just, it was so moving. And, um, that, that's one weird thing I've done and I don't know what I'm going to do about it, but I have saved every card, every postcard, every letter, every gift that has been sent to me since this all started. I've saved all of it. And, I have, I mean, a box full and I feel like I want to do some sort of art project with them. Like, because some of the, some of the cards have really nice encouragement Mm. on them. And then some of the letters that people have sent, you know, I I, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I just feel compelled to keep all these things and make some sort of art project that maybe I can donate to somewhere that with all this all of these, you know, wonderful, encouraging sentiments. So um, I do have an idea. I think you should respond to every one of them and send them Bucky nugs. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thank you for being on. Thank you for letting me talk about it. Yep. I thank. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>